Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Do you have a little unsolved murder in your home? Got some blackmail you want to unload? Are you the victim of some vulgar extortionist? I know a girl you should meet. She may not be the greatest private eye in the world, so what if it does cost you three or four hundred dollars? She sure is sweet. She's Candy Matson. Like to meet her? Hello. Candy Matson? Well, I wasn't sure when I looked in the mirror this morning. Had a rough night, eh? Oh, there have been rougher ones. Look, voice, before you get caught with my receiver down, who are you and what do you want? As to who I am, you'll find out very shortly. What I want is you. How romantic and over the phone yet. Let me finish. What I want is you to lay off that cable car business. Oh, that. Well, I'm afraid I can't. You see, I was sitting beside him when they discovered his transfer had been punched sort of permanently. That's how things happen with me. I get into the craziest routines. You see, I used to be a model. I've been told I have the proper displacement for such a career. But I found there wasn't enough money in it. A girl has to maintain a nice apartment on Telegraph Hill, keep enough clothes to highlight the uh, displacement I mentioned, and also eat, doesn't she? Sure. So I turn private eye. You meet a better class of people, mostly named Rigger or Mortis. Now, take this cable car deal. It's positively fantastic. But after all, this is radio, isn't it? Like to hear how the whole thing happened? Leave us trip along to Act One. I wanted to get downtown that morning, but I couldn't take the F car on Stockton. They were ripping up about 87 streets, which is par for the court. So I walked down Telegraph Hill and up to Mason. That's where the Bay and Powell cable car stops. All aboard! Come on, Lana, show that shapely ankle. We gotta make the Fairmont by Whitsuntide. The car was loaded, and so was the character next to me. I tried to budge into the seat between him and a fisherman's wharf dowager. But I couldn't quite make it. I'd forgotten my shoehorn. Say, pardon me, but would you mind reading your Wall Street Journal over that away a bit? I'd like to sit in here. Oh, if you insist. A knight of old. He budged his hips a quarter of an inch, and I slipped in, ready for my rocket ride over the hill and down into town. The trip, as usual, was uneventful. Three smashed fenders and several choice words I'd never heard before, but I wrote them down. By the time our prairie schooner reached the turntable at Market Street, the crowd on the car had thinned out. But uh, Buster was still beside me, his head buried in common and preferred. Market Street! I started to get down. Hey, lady, take your boyfriend with you. We're heading back up the hill. Boyfriend? I'll sue. He looks like the advance man for Lewis and Clark. How do you like that? He fell asleep over his stocks and bonds. I looked again. Hipsy wasn't asleep. (laughs) Hipsy was stone cold dead on market. What a twist. I, who always went on the prowl for a whodunit, got one literally tossed into my lap. He just hadn't gone out of this world serene-like. Oh, no. There was a steady slurp, slurp of blood trickling down his vest just north by northeast of the equator. After a half-hour wait full of questioning by homicide leg men, I knew my morning shopping tour was rained out. And after all, I was only going to buy an emerald clip to match the glint in my eye. Well, that would have to wait. I knew the next step. I grabbed a cab home. I wasn't long in waiting. Right on cue. And if it was the right cue, it would be Lieutenant Ray Mallard from headquarters, daintily pressing his cuticles against my apartment buzzer. I was right. What? I've been expecting you. Come on in, Mellard. You've been expecting me? Why, Candy? Naive little rover boy, you. Have a drink? No, no, I'm not in the mood. Uh, Just make it a double. Sit down, Mellard, and let's be civilized. Take off your hat. It is off. Oh? (laughs) Candy, for once I'm puzzled. You're just saying that. Yeah, because it's true. 
I've checked and rechecked. No matter how many loose ends I tie together, I still get no connection between you and Dwight Ellsworth. Dwight Hoosworth? Ellsworth. Your extremely limp traveling companion on the cable this morning? Mallard, I can give you an angle on that. Yeah? Yeah. The angle being that I didn't know him from Adam. Level? Straight. Oh, look, honeypot, this mediocre dialogue is getting us nowhere. What did you haul your size 11s in here for? Oh, frankly, I don't know. Uh, here, fill it up, will you? Well, you're not just going around in circles, Mallard. You're going around in doubles. Yeah, yeah. Like I've said before, Candy, you've got a pretty view from here. Oh? Wait till I turn around. I mean from your window. Look at that ship down there, just docking. Hmm? Where? Down there. There's oh. romance for you. Probably just in from the Far East. Here's your drink. Oh, thanks. You know, it is sort of romantic. Don't you think it'd be fun to jump on a tramp like that and whisk off to the South Sea? Hmm? On a honeymoon? No. That's what I thought. South Sea. Mallard. Don't call me Mallard. Why not? We're just playing for ducks, aren't we? Oh, uh, very crisp. Playing for ducks. No candy, we aren't. Not in this case. We've got a dead man in our hands. Rudy Toot Toot shot right through the heart. And you were sitting next to him. Sure, sure. Go on now. Get out of here. What? You heard me. Lift your hindquarters and get back to headquarters. Candy, I don't like that look. You've got something on your mind. Yeah, yeah, but you wouldn't recognize it if I told you about it. Uh, one word of warning. Don't dabble. You're in deep enough. Got it? Got it. Here's your hat. Grab it. So long, Mallard. See you around a jailhouse sometime. <laughs> Bye, fool fum. Twas then I smelled a big fat fee. That great big kind of attractive mallard. He missed the boat. Oh, he saw it, but he missed it. It was that ship he saw docking. That was the first time I came out of the dark since my Tunerville ride down the hill in the morning. I needed help, so I called an old friend of mine, if you can call that help. Rembrandt Watson was his name. He was a photographer and other things. He spent most of his life in the dark room dabbling with bottles. His negatives and prints were sharp. His thought processes not quite. But he'd given me assistance in the past, so I called him. Rembrandt Watson speaking. Photography, portraits, and camera work. Yes, Rembrandt, I know. Also uh, available for gardening, janitorial service, and babysitting. Rembrandt, it's candy. Especially at the over 21. Who? Candy? Now you're tuned in. How oh, dare you, baggage. I was experimenting with a new type of formula. 90 proof for 100. 100. And candy, it works beautifully. There's a delightful little pixie in a pink ballet skirt in my living room. Well, leave her there and get over here immediately to my place. Take a cab. I'll pay for I'd it. I'd much rather have a handsome carriage with a brace of chestnuts. You've got them in your head. Now just do as I say and get over here. <laughs> Float in, Rembrandt. Gad Frick. Where's the man to take me cloak, gloves, and topper? You're wearing a sport coat and slacks, and you know I have no man. And therein lies your basic trouble, my dear. You have no man. Now, Rembrandt. Every man should have a woman. Every woman should have a man. It's the incontrovertible law of the universe. Candy, you should have a man. You. Sure. I'm no longer a man. I'm a sprite, transcending the world. Well, and... stop transcending a moment and come down to Earth. We've got a job to do. How poetic. How idyllic. We've got a job to do. Uh, for money? Eventually. Oh, one of those. Very well, my dear. Bring me up to date. Well, I... I don't really know if I can or not. Good. Then I shall leave and return to me formula. Oh, no. What I mean is, the whole story is so fantastic you'd never believe it. I might. Try me, Candy. Well, I get on a cable car and sit next to a character reading the Wall Street Journal. A strange coupling. A cable car and the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. And when we get to the end of the line, my friend next to me is dead. Probably the ride down the hill frightened him to death. Uh-uh. He looked like a used punch board. He had a neat little bullet hole through his heart. Candy, my little ballerina friend in the pink skirt is more believable than what you just told me. I told you it was fantastic, but none of how it happened. Now, sooner or later, Mallard is going to come out of his fog. And when he does, I'm going to be out of a fee. A fee that so far doesn't exist, my pretty. It will, if my hunch is right. Now, here's what I want you to do. Go down to the Chronicle and get all the back files you can on Southern Island Steamship Company. The Chronicle? A pleasure. I have a few questionable companions. 
there who indulge in formulas. Stay away from those companions and just do as I ask. Very well, my dove. I go, but entirely against my will. And where will you be? Around town, Rembrandt. I've got to do some legwork. Let me assure you, Candy. You have just the right equipment for it, too. What a joint. I'll bet they mount slit gullets on the walls instead of deer heads. Well, come on, Candy. Get your tools out and screw up your courage. Yeah, miss, what'll it be? Uh, nothing right at the moment except information. Information, water, both free. What do you want to know? Well, I'm, I'm looking for the purser off the of Dwight Sonia. I hear he does his shore duty in here. Uh, that's right. Name Campbell. That head on the table over there belongs to him. Mm, thanks. <laughs> Hello, sailor. Hey, Campbell. Wake up. Uh, I'll leave me alone. Come on, snap out of it. Uh, who are you? What do you want? My name is Candy Matson. I want to ask a question. Oh, I'm only drinking. Go away. Not until I find out what I want to know. Dwight Ellsworth was murdered this morning. For what? I thought that would bring you to. Uh, well, that's the nicest news I've heard since VJ Day. What do you want to know? Where did his brother live? That stooge. He's got about as much spine as a water eel. Never mind. I want to find him. He seems to keep his whereabouts as secret as an atomic stockpile. Uh, the whole family ought to be knocked off. Uh, he lives out in Seacliff, 25 Dashell Road. Good. A bartender, buy my friend a little reward. And one for yourself, too. <laughs> Well, so far, so good. Oh, how did I know about Campbell, the purser? Well, you see, I have quite a few friends, most of whom my pal Mallard doesn't approve. So I grabbed a cab and navigated the driver out towards Seacliff. It was so foggy I couldn't see the meter. But I paid him anyway, gave him a neutral tip and dismissed him. There it was, 25 Dashell Road. An austere-looking cabana. One that dared you to ring the front doorbell. I dared. I had the awful feeling I should have been around at the side door delivering hand laundry. Good evening. Well, except for the fog, yes. Uh, is Mr. Ellsworth in? Yes, he is. But I'm afraid I must ask you to leave. There has been a death in the family. I know. That's why I'm here. Come in, please. Thank you. Walk this way, please. Oh, I'm afraid I, I couldn't. Even if I live to be a hundred. Mind your tongue, young lady. You're in the house of an Ellsworth. Oh, hoity toity. The old babe had delusions of grandeur. Well, no need to get uppity with me. I've mingled with royalty. I once played a bit part in a Rita Hayworth picture. But this old gal was really something. She couldn't have been more than 45, yet looked like something out of the barracks of Wimpole Street. She ushered me into a large ceilinged living room, and there on the divan was my boy his head lowered into his hands and quite obviously touched. Quite obviously. Roger, this young lady is here to see you. I don't believe you mentioned your name. Uh, Candy Matson. Uh, Matson? You in shipping, too? Mm, of a sort. Oh, uh, this is my wife, Miss Matson. You'll pardon me if I don't seem hospitable, but my brother was murdered this morning. I know. I was sitting next to him when it happened. You were? Don't talk to her, Roger. I don't trust her. This whole thing is a threat of some kind. No, it's not a threat. It's a business proposition. I'll come right to the point. You see, I'm a private detective. Oh, one of those persons. Put your nose back down, Mrs. Ellsworth. I want to get the show on the road. Yes, I'm a private detective, and I'm in a spot, too. The police think I'm connected with the case in some way, so... I'm here for a double purpose. I'm listening, Miss Matson. Roger, I forbid you to speak with this this woman. Too late, Mrs. Ellsworth. Now, this is it. I'm in this business to make money. Give me a check now for $300, and I'll find out who killed your brother. And I'll also clear myself. Roger, I'm warning you. Naturally, you want to see the killer of your brother brought to justice, don't you, Mr. Ellsworth? Don't you? I... Yes, yes. Here, I'll make a check out right now. Thank you. 
Just make it out to Candy Matson. Payable today. A lovely collection of guns you have, Mr. Elson. You hunt much? Mm. Oh, yes, yes. My wife and I are quite fond of shooting. Uh, she's an excellent shot. Ah, there you are. Thank you. I'll be in touch with you sometime tomorrow. Mr. Reed didn't say a word. She just stood there against the fireplace and shot sparks through me. After I waved the check in the air a few times to dry the ink, she showed me to the door. Very clever, aren't you? Taking advantage of a weak-willed man. I wonder who made him that way. Don't cash that check. I mean it. Don't cash that check. Mrs. Ellsworth, $300. I need the money, badly. I need some new rolls for my player piano. I buzzed back downtown. I wanted to cash that check in a hurry. I knew of only one person who would give me the crisp green at that hour of the night. Uncle Charlie, the honest miller who ran the chase room. Uncle Charlie, in the strict sense of the word, was a gentleman. So with a tender little pat on my cheek, he cashed the check and I went up Telegraph Hill and home. All of a sudden, my eyes did a couple of inverted loops. Oh, my lights were on. Who's in here? All right, speak up. Oh, Candy, the light of my oh. life. Come join our party. Oh, Rembrandt, you gave me a scare. You don't scare easy what? either, Candy. Got something on your mind? And Mallard. Well, how ducky, a midnight soiree. What goes on here? Well, that chicken you had in the icebox is delicious. Was delicious. Looks like you've done everything but eat the bones. Your vintage is superb, too, Candy. Have a little formula? No. Now, now come on, what gives? That's my line, Candy. What gives? You're in on something, and I want to know about it. Oh, Mallard, believe me, it, it's nothing. I, I'm, I'm just trying to parley a couple of hunches. Tall hunches. Look at all those clippings on the South Sea Island Steamship Company. What are they for? I meant to tell you, Candy, I had remarkable success down at the Chronicle. There's everything you want on that steamship line. Now, oh, Rembrandt, did you have to tell the whole world? Candy, you chide me unnecessarily. I merely had the clippings on the table when Hawkshaw here walks in on me. Okay, Candy, take it from there. I can't tell you yet, Mallard. Nothing makes sense yet. I, I've got about four loose ends that need tying off. If I'd only put two men to following you, I'd save myself a lot of grief. Two days, that's all, Mallard. Just give me two days. I think I'll have it for you. All right. But don't forget, the boys down at Kearney Street headquarters don't love you the way I do. Two days. No more or less. I gotta go. Thanks for the foul, chicken. Ah, very gay. Here, Rembrandt, here's $50 for you. Fifty? My word. What's all this talk about a recession? Go on and take it. Go someplace and stabilize the economy. <laughs> I whipped through the old newspaper clipping. It was all there. Fire at sea on Ellsworth ship. Two seamen lost off Ellsworth ship near Honolulu. South Sea Island line ship loses rudder in storm. On and on it went over a period of three years. I threw the papers back on the table. Helped myself to some of Rembrandt's formula. Turned down the lights and went out on the porch. The bay was dark except for an occasional path of light from a passing freighter. I sat down to think and think. Then, quick, quick, just like that, two little tumblers in my mind fell into place. Only one thing to do, and that was to do it the hard way. The next morning, just as the ferry building siren was announcing 8 o'clock to downtown San Francisco, I got Rembrandt on the phone. Candy, what on earth are you calling me for at this hour? Can't help it. There's work to be done. I did my work last night so extremely well that I'm just going to bed now. Sorry, you'll just have to delay your sack time. Meet me at the corner of Mason and Union in ten minutes, right where the cable car stops. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to take a cable car ride. What? One of those bouncing, jerky little contraptions? Not the way I feel this morning. Oh, yes, you are. Union and Mason in ten minutes. <laughs> All right, Rembrandt, get on. This is the silliest thing you've ever done, Candy. Maybe. We'll see. Dwight Ellsworth was already on the car when I got on here. And alive. How could you tell? He mumbled something when I asked him to move over. Sounds logical. Although I once remember stumbling into a corpse who mumbled for hours after it had been liquidated. 
And Rembrandt was in one of his rambling moods, so I let him alone. The car pulled over Mason Street, down Washington, and then swung on to Powell and up the hill. Now I watched the buildings and apartments carefully. It was a little red brick building, now a big apartment house, a woman's residence club, and so on. Then over the hill, more apartments, and the possibilities petered out at Bush. Well, only one thing to do. Canvas all those blocks between Washington and Bush. Okay, Rembrandt, off the car. The strangest corpse I ever did see. Uh, what do you say, Candy? Off the car. Come on. Now what? I just want to get to bed. Well, not for a long time, Boy Blue. Now, here's the pitch. You take this building, and I'll take the next. We'll alternate as we go along. Ask if a tall woman with a horsey face and dressed something like Queen Victoria ever lived around here. Oh, Candy. I know it sounds wild, but it's got to be done. A horse with a tall face and dressed something like... Oh, Rembrandt, look at me. Get that smoke out of your brain. A tall woman with a horsey face and dressed something like Queen Victoria. You got it? Got it. Okay, get going. It was slow and tiresome. And the answers I got. A tall gal dressed like Queen Victoria. Oh, sister. That was about par. Nope. Nobody like that ever lived here. Are you positive? A dame who fits that description? Yeah. I'm positive. The morning wore on and so did we. We were over on the other side of California Street now, so we stopped and had a bite to eat. I had pickles with mine and Rembrandt had olives on toothpicks in a glass. And again, we picked up the hunt. My heart was suddenly making with a rumba. There, just on the other side of Clay, in front of a three-story red brick house, was a police squad car. There was a little knot of people gathered around. Daintily lifting my crinoline, I did a Mel Patton down the block and up the front steps. I didn't have any trouble finding the room. The door was wide open, and there was a body on the floor. Four representatives of the law were buzzing back and forth. One of the buzzees was Mallard. Well... My little ambassador of violence. Why is it you're always around the extremely dead, Candy? I've got no time to brandy the ad libs, Mallard. Who is it? I don't know yet. No identification. Let me see. (gasps) Ah, a pen pal, maybe. I was right. I knew it. Knew it? Knew what? You're right. He was a pen pal. He wrote me a check last night for $300. His name is Roger Ellsworth. Very interesting. Must be open season on Ellsworth. Okay, Candy, time you filled in in the blanks. Start. Wait a minute. I want to look at the window over here. Mm Mm-hmm. Mallard, there are a couple of younger Ellsworths living around town here. I'm sure you'd like to see them stay healthy. Yeah? Get out to 25 Dashiell Road and pick up an old crone also named Ellsworth. Five will get you 20. She's the one you're after. Uh, all right. But you get back to your place and stay put, understand? I want to have a more illuminating chat with you. Oh, Mallard, I'm, I'm just like putty in your hands. The moon was coming up over Diablo and spraying a path of silver on the bay. Still no Mallard. I wondered what could be wrong. Well, this was it. This was the showdown. Have you seen a tall face with a horsey woman? Oh, Rembrandt. Candy, I'm so mad at you, I could... Oh, what's the use? Now what's the matter? What's the matter, she says. I've been roving all over Powell Street, ringing doorbells. Where did you go, you traitor? Oh, Rembrandt, I'm sorry. In, In the excitement, I forgot all about you. What excitement? There's been another murder. In a moment, there's going to be another... I'm looking right at you, Candy. Oh, cool off. Have some formula and stop snorting steam. (gasps) What was that? Your window, Candy. It just shattered. What? Oh, wait a minute. That window didn't shatter by itself. Quick, get the lights, Rembrandt. Now duck down here. What sort of a silly game are we playing now? This isn't a game, believe me. Candy! Candy, are you all right? Yikes, it's the gumshoe. Yes, I'm all right. Where are you, Mallard? Over here. Two houses over. We've got your girlfriend trapped on the roof next to you. Don't move and stay covered. Okay. All right, Mrs. Ellsworth. Are you coming down peacefully, or do we have to play cops and robbers? I'm not coming down until I get that candy match. She did it. She forced me to kill my own brother-in-law. Have it your own way. Okay, loosen her up a bit, boys. 
better than the 4th of July. Keep your head down, Rembrandt. Oh, is that what was up? Ready to come down, Mrs. Ellsworth? No, I'm not. That hateful woman. She's ruined my whole life. All my plans. Just because of her snooping and prying. She's going to die, I tell you. It was a miracle, Candy. You must have moved slightly just as she shot at you. Well, it was too close, I can tell you. She's dead? Oh, decidedly. I think she was dead before she hit the ground. That one shot got her. We went out to her house, and she was just driving off when we got there. We trailed her up to North Beach, lost her for a block, and then spotted her car at the top of the hill here. We arrived just as she was getting on the roof next door. Okay, now you tell me your little dream. Well, it was that ship docking that set my wheels going around. The name Ellsworth started burning in back somewhere. Mm-hmm. You saw the clippings we dug up. Yeah. The South Sea Island steamship lines were slowly being sabotaged. I did some checking, and I, I found that the insurance companies weren't going to renew. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't tie that in sooner. Oh, it's just that you have too many things on your mind, Mar- Mallard, dear. <laughs> I went out to the place on Dashiell Road, and when I left, I was pretty sure the old girl had knocked off her brother-in-law. Why? Well, for several reasons. One, she was a venomous old witch. Two, you've never seen such a collection of guns in all your life. And her husband admitted she was a darn good shot. I also saw one little pot gun that was very interesting. It had a silencer on it. Uh Uh-huh. That was the one she used on you tonight. And also the one she used on Dwight Ellsworth from the window of that apartment where you found her husband. How do you know? Go back there. You'll see a nice little bullet hole in the curtain with burned powder all around it. Now, don't tell me that... Yes, I'm telling you that she rented that place knowing that her brother-in-law always went downtown on a certain cable car. She waited that morning until we were riding by, and she plugged him. I have now heard everything. And the reason? Dwight Ellsworth, rather than fighting the insurance companies, had decided to sell his steamship line. But the old gal thought she'd beat him to the punch by knocking him off. The steamship company would then fall into her husband's hands. Ah. What about her husband? Well, after he gave me the check and I left, they evidently had a fearful row, and she spilled the beans. Somehow she lured him down to that place on Powell and... Gave him some lead poisoning, too. And that's all there is to it. Candy, I wish you'd have told me all these things earlier. We might have been able to save the life of Roger Ellsworth. No, it wouldn't do any good. Because if she hadn't killed him, I was going to. What? Mm Mm-hmm. While I was waiting for you to get here, the phone rang. It was Uncle Charlie, the honest miller. That no good Roger Ellsworth. His check bounced like a brand new golf ball. (laughs) What's so funny, Mallard? Listen in again to the further adventures of Candy Matson, Girl Sucker. Well, that's the way it goes. Sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. In this case, nobody did. Except Rembrandt. He'd stocked his darkroom with $50 worth of formula. And not the kind you use on negatives, either. Let's see. Murder on a cable car. Dwight and Roger Ellsworth done in as well as the old gal. One check that bounced. It really does sound fantastic, doesn't it? But I told you this was radio, didn't I? Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I did come out ahead at that. On the way out, Mallard leaned on and kissed me. The first time it ever happened. You know, at times, it's... It, kind of fun to be in the arms of the law. Listen again next week at the same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Heard tonight were Helen Cleave, Jack K. Hill, and Harry Bechtel, Jack Thomas as Rembrandt, and Henry Leff as Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. This has been a presentation of NBC, the national broadcasting company.
Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Did you ever know a girl, private detective? Perhaps not. They're pretty rare. Well, we've got one. Candy Matson is the name. And she's both pretty and rare. Figure? She picks up where Miss America leaves off. Clothes? She makes a peasant dress look like opening night at the opera. Hair? Blonde, of course. And eyes? Just the right shade of blue to match the hair. You're expecting more? All right, let's meet her. She's on the phone now. In her penthouse on Telegraph Hill in San Francisco. Hello, Candy Matson. Well, bless my ever-loving little old serial number, Candy Matson. Watch out how you go tossing your serial number around, Pally. Who is this? Candy, I hope you remember me. This is Sergeant Kenley down at Fort Ord. Kenley the Galan, uh-huh. the G.I. who filled my slipper with beer and drank it. <laughs> That's me, the poor man's Diamond Jim Brady. Sure, I remember you. I met you when I was down at Fort Ord with the U.S.O. What's on your mind, Kenley? Wait a minute, I'll put it this way. What's new? I like this is new. We're having a big shindig at the Senior Non-Commissioned Officers Club tomorrow night. Uh, you are elected as the girl most likely. Finish the sentence. Okay. As the girl most likely to be the queen of a ball. Oh, Kenley, you mad lad. I'd adore it. But what would I do for a chaperone? I what? Don't play dull. You heard me. Oh, 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 sure. Well, why don't you bring your mother? Wonderful idea. And I know just the fellow. Roger, Kenley. I'll report to the orderly room sometime tomorrow afternoon at Fort Ord. <laughs> That's the way things happen with me, so casually. I'm at home on Telegraph Hill overlooking San Francisco Bay, polishing a few old sapphires, when the phone rings. Sounds innocent, doesn't it? But uh uh-uh. I ran into two rather grisly murders in Monterey. Want some details? Listen. When I told the sergeant I knew just the fellow to be my mother, I met my old pal Rembrandt Watson. In former days, Rembrandt, an A1 photographer now that he doesn't imbibe, used to see double by noon, triple by four, and complete darkness by eight. One night, the darkness became too dense and he suddenly saw the light. That's when he threw all his bottles out the window. Of course, he was arrested for disturbing the peace, but he hasn't touched a drop since. And when I mentioned Rembrandt as my chaperone, I wasn't fooling. He's been like a mother to me many, many times. He was just back from his vacation, so I got in my car and drove over Powell and down California Street. At Grand Avenue stands Old St. Mary's, and on the bell tower just underneath the clock, there's a sign that says, Son, observe the time and fly from evil. I'd seen it before, but somehow that afternoon it had an added meaning. I parked my car and went across the street to Rembrandt's apartment. Candy. Rembrandt, you old dear, how are you? Wonderful, just wonderful. Darling, you're looking simply grand. Uh, slice it thinner, Rembrandt. You've only been gone three weeks. Oh, sorry, dear. Do come in, won't you? Mm-hmm. I'm just having some tea. Won't you join me, Candy? I'd love it. It's all ready. Oogly bleep, bleep, bleep. Bob. Wait a minute. What was that again? In case you don't know, Dove, that's Bob. Where did you ever pick up Bob? I was visiting a friend of mine last night, a professor of psychology, over at that institution across the bay. California? No, San Quentin. He's a penologist. He played some Bop records for me. Well, what do you think of Bop, Rembrandt? They say it's the latest thing. Why, girl, I can remember when they were playing Bop back in 1926. You can? Well, certainly. Only in those days they called it Vodo do do Vodo do 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 Here's your tea, Dove. It's warm. Thanks. What brings you by this afternoon, Candy, dear? You. I've got an invite to a ball for both of us. How delightful. I'll get my Grand Marshal's uniform out of my trunk. It's not that kind of a ball, Ducky. It's just a dance for soldiers at Fort Ord. Fort Ord? That's down in Monterey. That's right. And I want you to go along as my chaperone. Candy, I'd really love it. Good. I'll pick you up at noon tomorrow. Oh, I'm sorry. I have an appointment at two. You run along and, and I'll get the Del Monte special. Okay, and I'll pick you up the station in Monterey. Splendid, splendid. Oh, uh... Mm. By the way, dear, I'm just a little... uh... Oh, sure. Here, take 20. Oh, no, no, not that much, Candy. (laughs) No, 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 yourself, I insist. I'm so glad you're firm about these things. Thanks ever so much. Not at all. Thanks for the tea, Rembrandt. I'll see you in Monterey. (laughs) 
I gave Rembrandt a little chuck under the chin, he quivered his bushy eyebrows, and I left. If I was going to be queen of a military ball, I had to get some royal raiment. I picked up a mantilla and a strapless evening gown you had to hold up by sheer concentration and deep breathing. <laughs> then I had a quiet dinner for one, please, James, and went home and climbed aboard the Dream Express quite early. When I woke up, I had the nasty feeling that I had something to do. Then I remembered. I had a date that evening with Mallard. That's Inspector Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. The nomenclature reads, 6'2", weight 190, nice features, smart guy when it comes to solving a crime, but when it comes to talking about us and the future, he freezes up completely. I got dressed and whipped down to the Hall of Justice on Kearney Street. Well, Candy, how's Telegraph Hill's greatest lady detective? <laughs> At the moment, Mellard, dear, I'm just between detectives. Kind of slow, huh? No, not slow. I just wrapped up a case. Now I want to take it easy for a few days. I've got news for you, Candy. Such as like what? Such as like I can't keep our date for tonight. Oh, Mallard, I'd been counting on it. I know, Candy. I'm sure sorry. <laughs> but how did I know this guy was going to do what he did out in the Taraval district? Playing straight, I say. What did the guy do out in the Taraval district? He parlayed a sudden impulse into a seat in the gas chamber. How so? He done in his old lady. Mallard, don't talk like that. Okay. He ostracized his wife from the world of the living. With a pipe. That's better. Over the head. I get the picture. Anyway, I've got news for you, too. And yours would be? I'd have to break our date tonight anyway. Uh-huh. I just knew I was going to get stood up. And tonight's the night that Tex Acuff is playing in Loves of Laredo. Candy, it's Acuff's best movie. Acuff will just have to keep his chin up. You're busy in the Terraval, and I've got to be at a dance at the NCO club at Fort Ord. Oh, that's right. I am busy tonight. So you're going to Fort Ord, huh? Mm-hmm. Weren't you there a couple of times during the war? That's right. With the USO. That same sergeant still there? The same sergeant. He's the one who asked me tonight. Now, this calls for drastic action. Come here, Candy. Mallard. It was one of those rare moments. Mallard kissed me. Part of me floated out of his office. Then part of me floated back in and picked up the rest of me. Then all of me floated out again. Then I realized I'd forgotten my hat. I went back and got it. Then I saw I didn't have my purse. I went back and got that. Keep this up and you won't even get past Market Street, let alone to Fort Ord. That Mallard, he can do the sweetest things sometimes. That was one of them. I got in the car, shifted into low, and that's the last I remember until I came to in front of the rancho in Carmel. Obviously, one kiss from Mallard was better than a tank full of hundred-proof octane. I registered, got a cabana out and back, showered, changed, and drove back into town. The drive down must have been dusty because I was extremely dry. So I stopped at Griff's, a cute little place with old theatrical pictures all over the walls. Yes, miss? Would you care for something? Oh, yes, a, a martini, please. Very dry. Very dry. right -o. You're new here, aren't you? Yes, I am. I started working here about three weeks ago. I thought so. I was down about a month ago, but I don't remember seeing you. No, the fellow who was here became ill. Mr. Griffin hired me. Nice place to work. Oh, yes. It's very enjoyable. Here you are, miss. Thank you. I... I know you don't know who I am, but I'm a very good friend of Mr. Griffin's, and I came away without any money. Could you cash a check for me? Well, I don't know. I'd like to, but do you have any identification with you? Oh, yes, of course. Here, my driver's license. Matson. Candy Matson. Mm-hmm. Now I know why I thought I recognized you. Aren't you presiding over the dance tonight at Fort Ord? Well, yes. Why? I saw your picture in the paper yesterday. Yesterday? What? I only knew about it myself Yes. Oh, that Kenley, what an operator. I'll be happy to cash your check, Miss Madsen. <laughs> Good. I'm going to need it. A queen has to scatter a little gold amongst her subjects. The lad cashed my check and I left for the fort. I drove out past Seaside, then on past Ord Village and onto the reservation itself. The guard motioned me through the south gate with a wave of his hand and a... <whistles> yep, still the same old Fort Ord. I wove my way through the streets and finally pulled up in front of the senior NCO club. 
as I got out, there was my pal Kenley coming down the steps in his fatigues yet. Oh, Candy, you beautiful thing, you. Don't you beautiful thing me, Sergeant Kenley. What's the matter? You know what's the matter. They printed a picture of me in the Monterey Herald yesterday. Well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong? When the paper came out yesterday, I hadn't even heard about your wing-ding tonight. Oh, don't be mad, Candy. Uh, I've never seen you say no to a worthwhile cause yet. This is a worthwhile cause? That's right. Every cent we take in, we're turning over to the community chest. Oh, well, that puts a different light on it. Oh, I knew you'd see it that way. Mm Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. You don't charge for these NCO dances. How are you getting any proceeds out of it? Oh, I didn't tell you, did I? Every half hour, we're having a raffle. The highest bidder gets a free dance with you. Oh, that Kenley. Well, it was getting dark, and the Del Monte special with Rembrandt aboard would soon be pulling in. So I went back to Monterey. All of a sudden, I decided to play games. About a mile from town, the train stops at Del Monte itself. I thought it might be cute if I went back, got on the train there, and met Rembrandt that way. There she was, coming right in on schedule. I parked the car and went over to the little country-like station. The train wasn't in sight yet. It has to make the bend around Seaside. There it was. Now the headlight was sending its beam down the shining rails. It stood out like a beacon in the Monterey twilight. Then... I saw it. The glare of the locomotive's light picked up the crumpled body of a man. It was stretched across the tracks in a grotesque manner. Suddenly my mind flashes signaled my feet and I moved. It was a man, all right. The train was getting closer. I grabbed him by his lead-like shoulders and tugged. He wouldn't budge. I tried again, but still no luck. I looked down in desperation. That's when I saw that one of his feet was jammed between the rail and the tie. I gave a yank and the foot came free. Then I grabbed him by the shoulders again. He must have weighed over 200, but little by little I was getting his body over the rails and off under the shoulder. Finally I made it, just as the Del Monte rolled by. The body had fallen over on top of me as I pulled him away from the rails. I shoved him to one side and he flopped over. As he did so, I realized my companion was very cold, very limp, and very dead. A card fell out of his pocket and I did the natural thing and picked it up. By that time, the train was pulling out. I tried to catch it, but it was too late. It was only a mile into Monterey, so I left my cold friend and drove in after the train. I got snarled in a traffic jam just before I made the right turn into the station. So Rembrandt was waiting for me as I drove up. Dove, how nice of you, right on time. Never mind the salutations. Come on, we've got work to do. Don't tell me I'm supposed to take your place at the ball tonight. No, I've discovered a body. Candy, dear, how occupational. How irritational. Come on, let's go. Where? Monterey Sheriff's Office. But you'll miss the ball, girl. Not tonight, I won't. I darn near got killed myself. Tonight I'm going to have fun. Let's go. I went over to the Sheriff's Office. They have a staff of nine men. I placed everything in their capable hands and drove Rembrandt over one of the local hotels. I went back to the rancho, climbed into my strapless queen outfit, and went back to pick him up. He came out with a bewildered look on his face. I didn't say anything. We drove along through the Ord Reservation, and finally I popped the question. Okay, Rembrandt, what's wrong? Nothing, except this. What's this? A card. While I was dressing, a man knocked on me door, shoved this into me hand, and told me to tell you about it, and left. Let me see it. Here. Careful, Dub. Don't go off the road. The military wouldn't like that. They dislike messy forts. Wait a minute. Look through my purse, Rembrandt. Precisely for what? For a card that matches this one. Mm, mm. Lipstick, lighter, handkerchief. Oh, here we are. You're right, Candy. It matches exactly. Does it make sense? Not yet. This is a warning, Rembrandt. A warning to keep my nose out of somebody's business. Yes, but what's this on the card? I don't understand. I thought you were studying the cello, Rembrandt, dear. Oh, I am. Then you should know what that is. That's the musical signature for F sharp. The gent who gave Rembrandt the card had obviously been following us since we left the sheriff's office. Now I knew I was in on something. But what? That body didn't crawl on the tracks all by itself. It was placed there deliberately in hopes the train would mangle all evidence. I'd have to worry about that later. 
I had a date to keep, and I was going to keep it. Once again, I pulled up in front of the senior non-commissioned officers club. Rembrandt helped me out, and we went in. The joint was really jumping. As we went in, dear old Sergeant Kenley was there to greet us. Oh, Candy, how oh, glad you're here. I was getting worried. Ha, ha, ha. He's worried. Yes. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. I don't get it. That's all right, Sergeant. Kenley, I want you to know Rembrandt Watson, my chaperone this evening. You're, uh, you're... Oh, uh, glad to know you, sir. You didn't talk down to me, Sergeant. I have campaign ribbons for just such battles as this. Okay, Kenley. When do we start the raffle? Right now. Come on, Candy. If ever a girl gave her all for the army, that was I... I danced until my insteps had insteps. Going on toward midnight, they started another raffle. A dark-looking sergeant bid six dollars, and I was to dance with him. Rembrandt was fighting the Boxer Rebellion all over again with some top kick, so I was stuck, but good. Miss Matson, that was my last six dollars. You shouldn't have done it, Sergeant. Oh, it was worth it. But if you don't mind, I'd rather not dance. Oh, sergeant, for those kind words, I make you a lieutenant. Uh, no, thanks. I'd rather be a sergeant. <laughs> uh, but would you mind walking outside on the terrace? It's awfully stuffy in here. Sergeant, it would be a pleasure, believe me. We went outside. The night was strictly moderage, sparkling with stars, not warm, not cold, and a slight smell of sardines in the air. That's good. That meant the canneries were working. But speaking of the smell of fish... Uh, let's go this way, shall we? I... Why? There's a beautiful view of the entire bay from over here. Look, Sergeant, I only came down here to I dance... I said come with me. What? You're hurting my oh, arm. My now wait just a minute, Sergeant. No, you wait, Candy Matson. I know who you are. You had to come down here where you weren't wanted. You don't seem to understand you that I was... You had to go find a body on the tracks. And you ended up with two cards that were identical, didn't you? Give me those two cards. I... I haven't got them. <gasps> don't give me that. Where are they? I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't got any cards. Okay, sister. You ask for it. <clears throat> The sky was whirling. Time was nothing. I was in China. I was in Cuba. I was nowhere. Suddenly, things came into focus. I was out in back of the club, and Rembrandt and half a dozen G.I.s were standing over me. Well, there, there, Ducky. You're going to be all right. What happened? I got slugged. That's what happened. And the rat only bid six bucks for the privilege. How do you feel, Dal? Terrible. Oh, Kenny, I feel terrible, too. I don't know how this could have happened. Hi, Kenley. Oh, my head. Oh, gee, I, 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 I just can't apologize enough. I... That's all right. I came down here to be queen of the ball. I got crowned, didn't I? I thanked Sergeant Kenley for the party. It was a nice affair. After all, it was no fault of the NTO club or Fort Or that I got wrapped over the head. So I got Rembrandt in the car, and we drove back into Carmel. Rembrandt was quite concerned. He suggested that we stop, and I have a touch of brandy. I didn't argue. We went into Griff's. Oh, good evening. You wish something? Yes, please. Uh, brandy for the lady. Lemon Coke for me. Uh, brandy and... Uh, what was that again? A glass of water. A glass of water, again. Yeah. Uh, hold it. Uh, you weren't here this afternoon. No, I worked the evening shift. Frankie's here during the afternoon. Frankie? That's right. Frankie Sharp. That's when Roman candles went off and bells started to ring. Thinking back to the afternoon, the guy who cashed my check had one slight characteristic. I remembered as he handed me the money, his cufflinks were stamped musically F sharp. I must have had a funny look on my face because Rembrandt spoke. What's the matter, dear? Doesn't the brandy agree with you? No, no, it's not that. I, I'm trying to put one and one together to make two, but it doesn't add. Uh-oh. No. Looks like we're going to have company. Pardon me, Miss Madison. I hope I'm not intruding. Not at all, Corporal. Everybody's getting into the act tonight. Sit down and make yourself comfortable. Oh, thank you. I just heard the regrettable news. You getting slugged at the club. I, I left just before, I guess. How did it happen? He was a sergeant. He outranked me. Oh, incidentally, my name is Case, Dave Case, 4th MP Company at the Fort. Glad to know you, Case. This is Mr. Rembrandt Watson. Oh, how do you do? How do you do, sir? Where's your accoutrement? What? 
but you're a billy club and pistol, your armband and so on. <laughs> uh, I don't wear them when I'm not on duty, Mr. Watson. Well, you're in good hands, Candy. Well, I've got to leave. Can't stand the place where they only serve you water. That's what you asked for, Rembrandt. I know. Deal not the temptation, I always say. Glad to have met you, Corporal Case. Yeah. Good night, Candy, dear. Uh, see you in the morning. You two just stay and talk over the Battle of the Bowl, that knob on Candy's head. <laughs> Good night, Rembrandt. Does he always duck out on you like that, Miss Matson? He's a man of whims. That's why I like him. Mm. Mm, this brandy isn't doing anything for me, but I needed some air. Corporal, do me a favor and walk me down to the beach and back, will you? Why, I'd be delighted. <laughs> We left Griff's and walked down Ocean Avenue to the beach. It was a half moon shining down from the east and hitting the waves. It made the ocean look almost luminous. Feel a little better, Miss Matson? Yes. Mm, I wonder what that character hit me with. Come on, Corporal. Let's go along the beach a little way. Aren't you cold? No, this is fine. Wait. Wait a minute, Case. Hmm? What? Let down there. Right at the water's edge. Looks like the body of a man. I... I... You're right. Let's go. We ducked around a clump of brush and hightailed it down to the water. Sure enough, it was the sprawled figure of a man. Every time a wave came in, the body would change position, setting new patterns of crumpled legs and oddly shaped arms. Give me a hand, Case. Yep. Help me roll him over. Okay. There. Hey. Look at this. What, Miss Matson? Do you know who this joker is? This is the lad who flattened my skull at the dance tonight. Yeah, I'll bet he's awfully sorry he did it now. He's quite dead. The corporal and I pulled and tugged, and I finally got the boy high and dry up on the beach. Then we ran up to my cabin. Operator. They must have closed the switchboard for tonight. Well, you wait here, Miss Matson. I'll run up into town. There's usually a prowl car there at this hour. Okay, but hurry, Corporal. Katie slammed out the door and I was left alone. I walked over to the cabinet, got a cigarette and lit it. Thoughts were going through my head like a roulette wheel, but none of the thoughts were dropping in the right slot. Then suddenly... Did you ever get the feeling you weren't alone? That a pair of eyes was watching your every move? I wheeled around. There he was, standing over by the closet door. Good evening. My bartender friend of the afternoon. Enjoying your cigarette, Miss Matson? Yes. Yes, I am, Mr. Sharp. Fine. Drag on it. Drag deeply. But the last drag always tastes the best. What's on your mind? You. You've been on my mind ever since you pulled that body off the tracks this evening. Was that one of your jobs? Oh, yes. Hadn't you surmised by my musical signature? Wasn't that being rather dramatic? I don't think so. All great artists sign their work. Why shouldn't I? I came here to paint. But they only laughed at me. I jeered. So I decided to paint in a different manner. It was beginning to pay dividends, too. But you and the others, you had to spoil it. I could have been big. Do you understand? I could have owned this whole country. Oh, no, Frankie. You leave too many of your cards around. Recognition. There has to be recognition for everything done in this world. Look. Here. I've got another F-sharp card, Miss Matson. So I see. I made it especially for you. About an hour ago. Is that when you held your pal's head under the surf down there on the beach? Shortly after, yes. And now I shall have to work fast, won't I? Your corporal friend with the muscles will be returning with the police. Over there against the wall, Miss Matson. You can't get away with this, Frankie. I think I can. You see, everything I touch must either live or die. In your case, it's too late for the former. 
So die you must. Corporal! Get back, Miss Matson. This guy's nuts. Looks like I'll have to add another. Oh! Corporal, you all right? Just got me on the shoulder. All right, Mac. Try this. Hang on to his gun arm, Kate. I'll try to get him with his lamp. Never mind that. He's going to drop that gun right now. Oh! Oh! Corporal down the hall. You'd better hold it, Sharp. I'm warning you. Okay, you ask for it. F Sharp was quite flat there at the bottom of the stairs. And Sharp being flat was a natural. He looked awfully good that way. All I can say is I am terribly grateful for Fort Ord's highly efficient MPs. Case ducked out to get the police, but halfway down the stairs he heard Sharp's voice in my room. He tiptoed back and listened just long enough outside my door. Just as Frankie had leveled his pistol at my head, Case broke through and wrestled the gun out of Sharp's hand. Oh, the rest of the facts? Well, I've got the dis and data right here. Frankie Sharp was a wise boy. He was dishonorably discharged from the Army in 1946. He came to the Monterey area with a complete load of Army uniforms, fatigues, and general equipment. He set up a little ring of other ex-GIs with bad records, all dishonorably discharged also, all professional gamblers. On Army paydays, he'd rig his mob out with GI uniforms. Then they'd gang up on the boys from the camp and take them for all their dough with marked cards and loaded dice. The gang was familiar with Army routine, so it was easy for them to make like real soldiers. But Frankie Sharp was keeping too much of the loot for himself, so he decided to set up a new gang. One by one, he had his boys marked for sudden and violent death. The first was the guy I pulled off the tracks. Sharp and the fake sergeant who slugged me were parked up on the highway watching to see if Del Monte Special put on the finishing touches. When the gag misfired, they followed me, found out where Rembrandt was staying, slipped in one of their business cards as a warning for me to stay out. But the fake sergeant turned chicken. He didn't want those F-sharp notes all over the area. So he came out to the NCO club, bopped me over the head, and got them back. When he returned, Frankie knew the fat was in the fire and that the time to strike was then. So he took his pen all down to the beach, gave him a finger wave and a permanent, the kind you don't wake up from. Then he went back to my cottage to wait for me. Sharp was his own undoing. The poor guy was a megalomaniac and insisted on signing his works of art. His greatest masterpiece, though, was one he autographed. It was called Picture of a Corpse at the Bottom of a Stairway. Because when we went down to look at his body, he still had his own F-sharp card clutched in his rigid fingers. Corporal Case? Good boy. He's been studying criminology with the United States Armed Forces Institute. He was discharged about a month later, and because of his considerable amount of gray matter, was promised the first opening with the Monterey Sheriff's Office. Oh, me, it's beautiful around Monterey and Carmel. The soft ocean, the gently rising knolls, especially the one on my head. That's the last time I'm going to be queen of a ball. Listen again next week at the same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... For Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Heard tonight were John Grover as Sergeant Kenley, Lou Tobin as the pseudo-sergeant, Kurt Martell as Corporal David Case, and Jerry Walter as Frankie Sharp. Henry Leff is Inspector Ray Mallard, and Jack Thomas portrays the role of Rembrandt. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Eloise Rowan was at the organ, and sound effects were created by Bill Brownell and Jay Rendon. Corporal David C. Case is an actual person. Any resemblance to other people in tonight's play is purely coincidental. The program came to you from San Francisco. This is Dudley Manlove speaking. You are tuned for the stars on NBC. Hello, 
Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Over here. What? Why, Myra Fisher. What are you doing here in a department store with your work clothes on? I work here, dear. I'm a wage slave. Well, I must say on you, it looks good. What do you slave at? I'm head of advertising and promotion. Well, quite a spot, hey, girl? Well, it was until this morning. Oh? Now my neck is in the fire. What'd you do? Forget to proofread one of your ads? Nothing so trivial, dear, believe me. But am I glad to have bumped into you? Maybe you'll change your mind when I tell you I've been shoplifting. No, I'm serious, Candy. Uh, could you spare a moment and come on up to my office? Why, sure. And wipe that frown from off your brow. It's wrinkling your makeup. Well, yours would wrinkle, too, if you had a missing Santa Claus helper on your hands. Well, well, now, there's a situation. And it almost broke Candy Matson's heart when someone told her there was no Santa Claus's helper, one Jack Frost. Listen, here she is now to tell you about it. That's right, what the man said. I ran into a deal where we had a missing Santa Claus helper, Jack Frost. The gent with the icicles was supposed to talk to the tiny tots at the Brownstone, one of San Francisco's larger and classier department stores. I had gone down there that afternoon shopping. I wanted a bow tie for my old pal Inspector Ray Mallard of the San Francisco Police Department. A bow tie that lit up and spelled Cossack when you pressed the button on the battery. That was when I bumped into this gal, Myra Fisher. We went up to her office on the sixth floor and she sat me down. Cigaretted me, too. You think I'm fooling about this Jack Frost thing, don't you, Candy? Well, now, look, dear, we all have our little peccadilloes. Yours just merely happens to be a missing Jack Frost. You'll get over it. I refrain from hurling this ashtray at you, Candy, only because of our long acquaintance. Good. Now listen to me. We've had a Santa Claus helper here for almost a month, and a darn good one. The kids were crazy about him. This morning, he didn't show. You don't suppose Jackie boy got in the mood and caught the Christmas spirit, do you? The kind that comes in pints? No, he wasn't that sort of Joe. Well, your answer's simple. Hire a new one. They're hired through an agency. I called the one we do business with, and they're fresh out of Jack Frost. And I've got to get one, Candy. Otherwise, I come down ten notches in the opinion of the brass. I don't want you to think I'm unsympathetic, Myra, but what can I do? Well, you get around, you know people. Find me somebody, anybody, who'll take over the job of being Jack Frost. <sighs> well, okay. I'll do the best I can, Myra. Candy, you're a dear. Yeah, one of Santa's dears. Okay, I'll try and find you a Jack Frost, Myra, but don't hold it against me if he turns out to look more like Humpty Dumpty. I went home and looked up the Webster definition of soft. It said soft, easily yielding to pressure. That was me, Candy Matson, girl dope. Here I had all my Christmas shopping to do, and I agreed to find a substitute for Jack Frost. I had no idea where to start. So I changed into something red and green for a stop and go, also for Christmas, and went over to see my friendly advisor, Rembrandt Watson. Rembrandt is a photographer and excellent, too, now that he doesn't have the sherry shivers or the port palsies. He lives on California Street, just kitten rompers from old St. Mary's, with a statue of Sun Yat-sen for company in a park next door. Candy doll, how delightful. Do come in, won't you? Thanks, Rembrandt. Oh, Pat, you're acquainted with my friend Diogenes Murphy, aren't you? Oh, yes. Hello again, Mr. Murphy. Oh, well, good afternoon, lad. You look prettier than you did the last time I saw you. Uh-oh, here comes the blarney. Uh, young lady, Diogenes Murphy, the honest Irishman, never says a word he doesn't mean. Now, how do you think I managed to sell so many used cars at me place out on Venice Avenue? Huh? Because you're an honest Irishman. <laughs> oh, 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 you're so right, lad. <laughs> Uh, incidentally, if you need a good car, I can get you one at a very reasonable... Diogenes? Oh, sorry, I got carried away. <laughs> I didn't mean to barge in on you like this, Rembrandt. Well, don't be ridiculous, dear. No, don't be. Think nothing of it, lad. I'm on my way now. Uh, Rembrandt and I were only discussing the situation of the world. And to what conclusion did you come? Uh, it stinks. <laughs> The bottom of the afternoon to the both of you. <laughs> oh, he's quite a boy. Yes, I'm very fond of Diogenes. What brings you around this way, dear? Jack Frost. <laughs> yes. Now, getting on with our conversation, what brings you around this way, dear? Jack Frost. Maybe the needle's bad. 
Shall we try again? I know how you feel. I reacted the same way myself. I'll give you the pocket-sized edition. The brownstone department store is without a Santa Claus helper, Jack Frost. He didn't show up for work this morning. I said I'd find him a new one. Oh, that's very sweet of you, Dove. Very dumb of me, Dove. I know of only one character who even remotely looks like Jack Frost. I met him up in Alaska when I was traveling with the USO. Won't do you much good down here, will it? No. That's why I came to see you, Rembrandt. Don't you keep a, a cross file on models you've used in photography? As a matter of fact, I do. Here in this little book. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Men, thin, extremely. I have just one, Pietro Tarantello. Would you care for a Sicilian Jack Frost? In Sicily, yes. Hey, what's that? Where? On that chair next to you. Oh, that's the afternoon paper, dear. Diogenes left it, I imagine. Yes, but on the front page. Here's the whole story about the missing Jack Frost on the front page. Ooh, what he got in his Christmas stocking. A slug through the head. That's no way to treat Jack Frost. And here's a picture of the guy without his false icicles. What the ham? Looks like he stepped right out of an 1890 Shakespearean play. I hate to say this, Rembrandt, but he resembles you. I take back what I said. Rembrandt. Divorce yourself from that tone of voice, Candy. I don't like it. Rembrandt, I've got an idea. You usually do. You like little children. Can't stand them. You like to talk to people. I abhor conversation. You like to be charming. Lost me charm. Gay. Lost me gay. With the help of a few icicles, Ducky, you're going to be Jack Frost. Rembrandt fought, he argued, he paced the floor, he had the vapors, he fainted. I brought him too. I won the argument. I got my friend Myra Fisher on the phone and informed her that one R. Watson would assume the role of Jolly Jack Frost on the morrow. She was delighted. I couldn't say the same for Rembrandt. Then I went home. I was greeted by a sound very much like that of a phone ringing. Using my keen instincts, I figured it was the phone. It was. Hello, Candy Matson. Uh, uh, how do you do, Miss Matson? Uh, allow me to introduce myself. Allowed? Uh, my name is Burke, Prentice Burke. I'm the first assistant vice president of the Brownstone. Brownstone? Uh, yes, that's a store of some kind, isn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, now, the reason for my call. Uh, there has been, uh, shall I say, a rather unfortunate occurrence in our store today. Mm, so I read. I need the help of a professional sleuth. Uh, you were highly recommended by the head of our advertising department, Miss Myra Fisher. Aha, uh -huh. the thick plotting. I beg your pardon. Oh, no need to. You didn't do anything. Okay, care to talk to me now, Mr. Burke? Oh, I'd much rather have you come down to my office, Miss Batson. Uh, this matter is uh, of an extremely confidential nature. I'm your girl, then, figuratively speaking. How long will you be there? Uh, as long as necessary. Uh, that's up to you. Very well. I'll be there in half an hour if I can find a place to park. <laughs> I only had time for a fast change, so I made it from Andescray to Taboo. I sniffed at it and felt I was on the right scent. Then I climbed in my car, drove down Kearney Street, waved a crisp single under the nose of a hotel doorman and had my car taken care of. Then into the brownstone and up to Mr. Prentice Burke's office. I flipped a hip past the girl's secretary and walked on in. Burke was waiting for me, that was obvious. I could tell by the expression on his face it was worried look number 12B. How do you do, Mr. Burke? I'm Candy Matson. Uh, oh, uh, uh, sit down, won't you? Mm, thank you. Now, our subject is what? Uh, a man named Jordan. That's on another network. I beg your pardon? Oh, that's all right. Uh, now, about this Jordan. Uh, yes, uh, Ralph Jordan, to be exact. Well, that's a relief. For a moment, I thought you wanted to talk about Jack Frost. That's just it. He was Jack Frost. Uh oh me and my big mouth. He was working here up until yesterday afternoon. And maybe you read about it. He was found shot today. Yes, yes, I read about it. That's the reason I've called you. Why didn't you have your own store detectives take over, Mr. Burke? Uh, no, no. Uh, that would never do. I want no one in the store to know what's going on. Ah, intrigue. Uh, quite possibly. I have reason to suspect that Jordan was killed by someone in our employ. I want to find out who that someone was before the police do and get it splashed all over the front pages. Publicity, can't you say? Uh, well, business has been off for uh, all year, and any bad breaks in the press would hurt us that much more. Maybe you've got a point there. I don't know. I know I have. Okay, I'll take the job. You say you have a suspicion. What is it? Well, nothing tangible. It's just a feeling I have. Oh, that's a big help. Well, I'll mush around and see what I can pick up. I'll bill you tomorrow for my first day's work. It's much easier to sustain a friendship on a daily basis. 
I left Burke looking as though someone had just called his store a bazaar. It was closing time, so I hefted my way through the crush and retrieved my car from the doorman. The Hall of Justice is right on my way home, so I decided to drop in on my old pal Mallard, Inspector Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. A nice guy to serve coffee to on Sunday mornings if you could ever lasso him. I never could get strong enough rope. Handy. What brings you around here? I hate to have my Christmas ruined so early. What about that Jack Frost character? Oh, yeah. Poor guy got it good. Where'd you find him? In his apartment over on 17th. He lived near Seal Stadium. Why so interested, Candy? Rembrandt's a dead ringer for the guy. I still don't get that. The gal who's head of advertising for the Brownstone was going out of her head for another Jack Frost. I talked Rembrandt into taking the job. (laughs) (laughs) Does sound funny, doesn't it? Bring me up to date, Mallory. Did you get any dope on the killing? Nothing but a forty-five slug out of the guy's wall. Ballistics is checking it now. Nothing else? If I did, I should tell you. No. Oh, I guess not. This goes beyond just a normal curiosity, Candy. What are you drilling for? Oh, it's only that I'm worried about Rembrandt. I got him the job. I'm responsible. I wouldn't want anything to happen to him. Ask a silly question, Mallard, and you get a silly answer. Okay, let's forget it. How's about dinner tonight? I've fought this thing long enough. Okay. Uh... Candy. Uh, yes, Ellen. We've known each other a good long time, haven't we? That's right. Ever since the fair on Treasure Island. We've had our little quarrels, little misunderstandings. Oh, but they never seem to last long, though, do they? No. That's why I feel I have every right to ask you a question. Wait, yes, I'd say you do, Mallard. Maybe I'll ask you tonight. No, 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 go ahead. Now's as good a time as any. Perhaps it is, Candy. You get around a lot. You meet people. Do you know where I can get a couple of tickets to the Rose Bowl game? My brain lit up like a Roman candle. I stormed for the door, turned back, stood there, my jaw waggling helplessly. Then I stuck my tongue out at Mallard and left. It was the only thing I could think of doing. Oh, he can make me so mad. But inside half an hour after I got home, I I started to laugh. (laughs) Felt much better. Just as I was puttering around getting ready, the apartment buzzer buzzed. That Mallard, much too early. But I was wrong. It wasn't Mallard. Well, Myra, what a surprise. Do come in, won't you? No, thanks, Candy. A friend of mine's waiting in his car outside. He's driving me home. Oh, I'm sorry. You can't stay for a moment? So, my dear, I just dropped by to leave this. Merely a little t- token of thanks for getting me off the hook. Oh, Myra, th- there wasn't any need to do that. Just a few pair of old stockings, dear. Getting me my new Jack Frost means more than you know. Here, please take them, oh. along with my very deepest thanks. Oh, thanks so much. A girl can always use them. Are you all set with my friend, Mr. Watson? Oh, yes. He came in this afternoon and filled out his withholding tax and so on. Very nice. I think you'll find him very efficient, Myra. Oh, what's the matter? Uh, pardon me. I didn't mean to frighten you. Oh, Mallard. Oh, silly of me. I must have jumped a foot. Oh, that's all right. He frightens me, too. Myra, I'd like to have you meet Inspector Mallard. Inspector, Miss Fisher. How do you do? Oh, fine, thank you. Now that I've caught my breath. Do forgive me, Candy, but I must rush. See you soon, I hope. Tomorrow, Myra, I'll be down to see how my lad's doing as Jack Frost. Thanks for the stockings. Well, aren't you going to invite me in? No, I'm not. Here's my coat right here. What's our hurry? Come on, let's go. I'm starved. I thought we could have a cocktail here before we left. You thought wrong. Two tickets to the Rose Bowl. From now on, you earn your cocktails, Mallard. (laughs) We went downstairs, and as I locked the front door, a car was just driving off. It was Myra, and she waved. And driving, if these tired old eyes hadn't deceived me, was Mr. Prentice Burke, vice president of the Brownstone. Well. Oh, well. Mallard and I climbed into our car and drove out to the cliff house. It was that kind of an evening. We had dinner, and after, I suggested we walk a bit. The night was crisp and clear, and the evening star was hanging out above the dark waters of the Pacific like an iridescent Japanese lantern. We cut across a little road above Sutro Baths where an old car barn had once stood and worked our way over the cliffs and stood high above Land's End. It was exhilarating. Penny for your thoughts, Candy. Inflation is still here. 
All right. I get two pennies. Well, I was just thinking, Mallard, dear. When you see a star in the sky, soft water below, feel Christmas in the air, how can there be violence in the world? An age-old question, pal. One I can't answer. I'm too small. Hey, you're cold. I'd better put my arm around you. Mallard, no. What's the matter? The headlights from that automobile are shining right down on us, and we... Mallard. Jenny, what's wrong? Got your flashlight with you? Sure. Also, my gun and my handcuffs. Anything else we need? A mortar, maybe? The lights from that car. They shone on something. Down there, under that tree. Oh, Candy, just for once, can't you stop digging up a mystery? Be human? I am being human. Come on, Mallard. I want to see what's under that tree. <laughs> We scrambled around through the brush, slipped into some sliding sand, and rode the crest down to the tree. It wasn't easy to get around some of those brambles, but get there I fully intended doing, because what I saw was red, bright red. You, you okay, Candy? Nothing that a, a new pair of nylons won't fix. Shoot the flashlight over the, this, this way a bit, Mallard. Uh. There, that's it. Now... Do you think I'm dreaming things up? Uh, what is it? Wait till I hold it up. Well, looks like some kind of a costume. Right. And look, if those aren't bloodstains, I'm a Labrador retriever. No, you're Candy Matson. Those are bloodstains. How was your boy dressed when you found him? Torn slacks, sweater, shoes, no socks. This was most likely his costume, then. Yeah. Don't move around too much, Candy. I want to have a good look at the ground. Hey, what are you doing down there? Who's that? The police. Now get up here and don't try any tricks. That's all right, officer. This is Inspector Mallard. Homicide. Oh, sorry, Inspector. That's all right. Stay right where you are. We'll be right up. Now, this is a break, Candy. I want you to drive me to a phone. I'll leave the officer here to guard the place. You can go home. I've got work to do here, okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. And for once, we had dinner before you had a chance to date, break the date. <laughs> This baby was hard to reconstruct. Was the guy knocked off out there at Land's End, or was he bumped off at his apartment, the killer driving way out to the beach and hiding the costume? Only time would tell. I went home, climbed into bed, and logged about eight hours, enough to give me fuel for the next day. In the morning, I went down to the brownstone. The shoppers were already swarming through the place. I spotted a floor walker and strolled over to him. Pardon me, sir. I, I said, pardon me, sir. I'm very busy, young lady. Make it as brief as possible. I, you do work here, don't you? Of course. You are the floor walker assigned to this section? That is correct. Come to the point, please. Of all the... Well, I have a good mind to report you. As you wish. As I said, I'm very busy. Now, what is it you wanted to know? The words are like gall in my mouth now, but where do I find Jack Frost? Right over there, in the back, two aisles over. Thank you. Not at all. I... Very much. All the high-handed characters. People like that make me steam. I was getting up a full head of dander, but it simmered out before I had a chance to boil over. Because as I rounded a corner, I saw Frosty Boy, or Rembrandt, if you choose, up on his platform with the cutest little blonde kid sitting in his lap. Well, well, well. Look who we have here. A great big boy. Hello there, son. Hello, Jack Frost. What is your name? Topper. Topper. My, what a fine name. How old are you, Topper? Five and a half. Five and a half. Well, you must go to school, Topper. Which one? Garfield. Garfield. That's a good school. Now, tell me, uh, what would you like to have me tell Santa Claus to bring you for Christmas, Topper? An electric train and a baseball bat, and I like to be in the seals for Lefty Old Duel. Well, I'll see what I can do to arrange that, Topper. I'll tell Santa Claus. Bye now. Goodbye. And thank you, and Merry Christmas. I hope you can make the boy's wish come true. O'Doul could use him. Candy, oh, I'm so glad you're here, Doug. Duck around into the back room for a moment. I've got to talk to you. Aren't you working, Frosty Boy? I got ten minutes off every hour. I'll take the break now. Right around there, Candy. Okay, I'll see you in a moment. <laughs> matter, Rembrandt? Even under those icicles, you look warm under the collar. Here, look at this. Every now and then, one of these moppets toddles up to me with a Christmas letter in its hand. A little red-headed girl handed me this about half an hour ago. 
I've been shaking ever since. Let me see. Dear Jack Frost, a word of the wise is sufficient. When you take your lunch hour, keep on going. Don't come back. Otherwise, you'll meet the same fate as your predecessor. Hmm. Just about what I expected. Andy, you mean to say that you're deliberately using me as a sacrificial lamb? By no means, Ducky. Go ahead, take your lunch. Then do as the note says. Keep on going. As a matter of fact, why don't you take off now? I'll meet you at your place in about an hour. That's the best news I've heard since Nelson's victory at Trafalgar. <laughs> I whipped upstairs, reported to Prentice Burke, got my first day's check, and on my way out, told his secretary she'd better get Burke some smelling salts. Then I went back down on the floor again. Sure enough, there was my boy, the floor walker. I wanted to have a few more words with him. Oh, you again. If you don't mind. I was just up to see Miss Myra Fisher. She wasn't in. Have you seen her down here? No, and what's more, I won't see her all day. She phoned saying she was feeling ill. Most inconsiderate, I must say, during the holiday rush. Yes, I must say. Uh, could you give me her address? She's a friend of mine. I've got to see her. Her address? Well, yes. I write it down here on one of my cards for you. Myra Fisher, 227F, Union Street. There. Thank you. You're so kind. <laughs> I had all the ammunition I wanted. A check signed by Burke and a card written by the floor walker. His name was Simon Liggett. With that, I ducked into a phone booth and called Mallard. Homicide, Mallard speaking. Good boy. This is Candy. What did you find out at Land's End last night? A couple of very juicy footprints. They give us nothing. Did you make any casts of them? Why, sure. Mind if I borrow a couple of them for a few hours, Mallard? Well, I don't see how it'll hurt. Sure, okay. Thanks, Mallard, dear. I'll be by in a moment. And uh, I want to borrow you, too. I stopped by the Hall of Justice, got the cast of the footprints, shoved Mallard into the car, and then picked up Rembrandt. The thing was only a hunch, but my hunches have paid off, so I never ignore them. First, we went out to an address on Fifth Avenue near Clement. We got in the back door and went to work. Nothing made sense there. So we drove over to Reseda Way in the marina. Again, we got in and did some sleuthing. This time, we hit the jackpot. A pair of shoes in the closet matched the casts we had brought with us. Rembrandt, go out in the kitchen and, and see if this place has any ketchup. I'm not hungry, Dub. but oh, look. What are you up to, Candy? We've got enough to swing a case here. I'm working for a voluntary confession, Mallard. Tell me, what was the position that the, the Jack Frost was in when you found him dead? In a chair, like that one. His head slumped down on his chest. Good. Here's the concept, though. When are you putting it on? You. What? Without the bun or relish, Ducky. Sit down there, will you, Amber? Now, just go limp and let your head hang down. That's it. Now for a little seasoning. Oh, Candy, you're smearing me with this sticky stuff. Oh, no, for the sake of art. Hold still. There. How does he look, Mallard? Why, all the... Candy, it looks like the same guy, the real thing. Good. Now, Rembrandt, you just sit like that. Don't move. Mallard, you duck into that closet over there, and I'll hide in here. We've got a good view of the front door from both places, okay? Okay. There are times, Candy, when I admit I admire your genius. Genius, genius. Come on, let's hide. <laughs> The golden shafts of sun splashing in through the window from the ocean slowly turned pink, then purple, and into twilight. A minute ticked on. Once... <coughs> bless you, but quiet, though, Rembrandt. You'll muss up your ketchup. Five minutes. Ten. Then we heard muffled footsteps coming down the hall and a key inserted in the lock of the apartment door. fool I killed. No, no. Okay, buddy, oh, that'll be about what? enough. Oh, no. You, get him, Mallard. He's ducking. I'll get him. Oh, no. oh. Nice tackle, Mallard. All right, Mac. You're going to remain peaceful, or do I have to give you a little tap? No, no. 
I'll be quiet. You got me. I did it. I did it to both of them. I killed them. I, I killed them. I killed both of them. Both of them? Yeah. Look behind the sofa. The sofa. The girl. Jack Frost. The sofa. The sofa. Wait a minute, Mallard. I, I had to do it. I couldn't. Oh. But then they were going to do it. Oh, Mallard. More trouble, Candy? I killed both of them. I'm glad I killed Yes. An old friend of mine, the late Myra Fisher. The whole thing was jealousy. Not the jealousy of a man for a woman, but the jealousy of a man for a job. Simon Liggett had been with the Brownstone for almost 20 years. He'd worked himself up from the stock boy to a place where he'd been promised the job of head of advertising and promotion. He almost got it. Except at the last moment, Prentice Burke gave the position to Myra Fisher. That had only been two weeks before. He knew that Myra was on a probationary term, so he did everything he could to undermine her. Little things like changing ad copy, sending out false stories to newspapers. He figured that if he could keep the store without a Santa Claus helper, he'd break Myra's back and get the job by the first of the year. He paid a visit to the first Jack Frost and tried to bribe him into quitting. But the guy would have none of it. There was a struggle. Liggett lost his head and whipped out a gun and shot him. He was still in his costume, so Liggett stripped him, put some old clothes on him, drove out to Land's End, and ditched his costume. Then he felt sure there would be no Jack Frost the next day. But that's when Myra met me and I talked Rembrandt into taking over. By this time, Liggett was in a frenzy and would stop at nothing. He trailed Myra and Burke to Myra's home, killed her, took her body over to his place, and ditched it behind the sofa. The next morning, he wrote a note to Rembrandt and gave it to one of the little girls waiting in line to see him. Fear and envy were taking their toll on the poor guy's mind. I wanted to compare the handwriting, so I had Burke write me a check and Leggett write Myra's address on a card. Also, we had the footprint cast. Between the two, everything pointed toward Leggett. That's when I staged my little parlor charade with Rembrandt playing the part of a corpse. The sight, with Rembrandt's resemblance to the dead Jack Frost, would shatter anybody into a confession. But Christmas, in spite of everything, is a lovely time of year. And there is a Santa Claus. <laughs> Three of them for me, as a matter of fact. Mr. Prentice Burke, who sent me a very nice check for my efforts. Rembrandt Watson, who, out of sheer love for the job, went back to playing Jack Frost for all the kids at the Brownstone. And last but not least, Inspector Ray Mallard. He gave me a Christmas sock oh, right on my mouth, just where any well-placed Christmas sock should go. <laughs> Listen again next week at this same time for excitement and adventure. Just dial Candy Matson and a Merry Christmas to you all. Yukon 28209. <laughs> Tonight were Helen Cleave as Myra Fisher, Lou Tobin as Prentice Burke, and John Grover as Simon Liggett. Jack Thomas plays the role of Rembrandt Watson, and Henry Leff is heard as Inspector Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Sound effects were created by Bill Brownell and Jay Rendon. Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's story are entirely fictitious, with the exception of the part of Topper, which was played by himself. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. You are tuned for the stars on NBC. Hello, Candy Matson. I understand you've been hired to find out who knocked off Donna Dunham. Abrupt and right to the point. That's my business, old man who talks like a ghost. Take care of your health, little lady. Donna Dunham is dead. Let her stay like that. You take care of your cues and I'll show my peas, understood? Not quite. Listen to this. <laughs> oh, goody, goody. Bullets now delivered by phone. 
Thanks for the slug. I'll have it identified later. Maybe you'll be identified later. Remember what I said, Candy Matson. Forget about Donna Dunham. <laughs> My name is Candy Matson. I like money, lots of it. That's why I became a private eye. And, too, you meet such interesting people. Mostly dead. But getting back to the cash angle, that's why I took on the Donna Dunham case. I knew it was full of dynamite. But a girl has to eat now and then, maintain a penthouse on Telegraph Hill, and keep the moths out of a few mink coats, doesn't she? Sure. And a shot fired into your room from across the street at three in the morning is just one of those occupational hazards. So I took the job and the 500 and went to work. Like to hear how the whole thing started? Well, leave us proceed to Act One. I'd had a hard day at the office, sleeping all day, and I needed a bit of a tonic to pick me up. So the natural thing to do was to ground loop into the marigold room and see what could be done. As I sank down onto one of the padded stools, the dispenser approached. Uh, Make it a martini, my good man, very dry. So dry it comes out like a blotter. Look, lady, nothing would give me more pleasure, but I can't serve you here unless you have an escort. What? Oh, I, I'm, I'm waiting for someone. That's what they all say. But he'll be here very soon. I know, I know. It never fails. Why, you low-minded crock. For two cents, I I'd knock your... I see I arrived just in time. Save your two cents, my dear. Huh? You heard what the lady said? A martini. Uh, make it two. Uh, uh yeah. Uh, sure. I, I thought it was just another one of those... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, two martinis. Well, saved from a fate worse than death. Miss Matson. Who are you? A natural question. And I'd like a natural answer. Roberts is my name. Warren Roberts. Oh. I own a few steamships hither and yon about the world. Oh, yes, I know. I took a trip on one of your scows once. The food was a nightmare's nightmare. How do you think I came to be a millionaire? Ah, uh-huh. I see your point. How did you know my name and what do you want? I have a business proposition to make to you, Miss Matson. You're sure it's business, Mr. Roberts? Strictly business, Miss Matson. Call me Candy. You tell me the details and I'll tell you what it'll cost you. Fair enough. But don't faint. You can always make it back on your food. Well, I can hardly tell you here. Uh, suppose we drop over to my place. But I want that martini. My man will make us a batch over there. Oh, the things I do to make a living... Okay, let's go. Hey, uh, how about these drinks? Uh, here you are, my man, and save the martinis for some poor wayward soul who hasn't the wherewithal to make the purchase. Oh, good evening, Mr. Roberts. I, I didn't know you were expecting company. Uh, so soon after... Take Miss Matson's things, Montgomery, and bring us some martinis. Uh, they're all made, sir. Good. Let's go into the drawing room, shall we? Mm-hmm. Modest little mousetrap, isn't it? And I'll bet it's had a good path beaten to its door, too. <laughs> Quite a sense of humor you have, Candy. <laughs> well, it helps now and then. Here, sit down here. That's it. I, uh, I can't quite see you. It's like being behind a retaining wall. Oh, well, I'll just listen. What's the topic of conversation? A young lady named... Donna Dunham. Aha, uh-huh, the female element. What is your connection? Much strictly that of a patron. Oh? Miss Dunham was a hat check girl over the Scarlet Dawn. I heard her sing one night. I decided right then and there that I was going to sponsor her career. Was? Yes. Donna Dunham was murdered early this morning. By you? What? Are you out of your head? Yes, when I think of the fee I'm going to get from you. I uh, beg your pardon, sir. The martinis. Oh, oh, yes. Uh, Put them down there, Montgomery. Yes, sir. 
Very good, Montgomery. I won't need anything else tonight. Thank you, sir. Good night, miss. Uh, Good night. Uh, Don't sleep too tight. May I? Mm, You certainly may. I've been waiting far too long for one of these. There you are. (laughs) Well, as a sponsor, you didn't pick a protege with great lasting qualities, did you? No, I didn't. She was so young, so very lovely. Will you take the case, Miss Matson? What do I have to go on? Oh, very little. Well, my suspicions point to a musician who worked at the Scarlet Dawn. He seemed to resent very strongly my stepping into the picture. Were they going to get it? Off and on, until I started to back Donna's career. A very interesting triangle. What do the police have to say? The police, Miss Matson, have not yet been notified. What? I went over there this morning, and I discovered the body lying on the floor. I, I became confused. I, I locked the door and called the Scarlet Dawn. I told the manager that Miss Dunham was quite ill and wouldn't be able to appear tonight. Extremely ill, I'd say. Well, this is fine. You realize you're in trouble, don't you? Yes, I do. And that if I take this case, I'm sticking my neck out, too? Exactly. My uh, fee is 500 That's a fair price. In advance. Well, I'll make out a check immediately. Oh, won't you have another martini? I, uh, I don't think so. You know, you are very beautiful. Ah, thank you. But I already have a sponsor. And your lips are very, very kissable? The best you can buy from Max Factors. Are you sure you don't want another martini? Look, Roberts, let's get this straight. You're in the middle of a jackpot. Make that check out right now so I can join you. Then it's up to me to spring the both of us. In the meantime, get that glint out of your eye. The one that's wired for wolf calls. Understood? Very well. I'll get started right away. Where does the late Miss Dunham live? Just on the edge of Chinatown, 27B Gresham Alley. It's the only three-flat house on the block. I'll find it. And you, you just stick right here and don't poke your face out of the door. Now, the, uh... If you Now, listen, you, if you think you're going to get... Well, send me back to the last line in the chorus, if it isn't old Hawkshaw himself. Yeah, that's right. Hiya, Candy. Mallard, how you ever got to be a police detective, I'll never know. I heard you trailing me for the last two blocks. Maybe I wanted you to hear me. What are you doing over in Chinatown, Candy? I like tomato chow yuck. Uh-huh. Something up? Not with you around, there isn't. Look, Candy, just a little word of caution. We're laying for you. Oh. The chief isn't very happy about you busting up that Newton case last month. Somebody had to. The score was still tied in the 27th inning. Stop gagging, Candy. What are you doing around here? You don't like tomato chow yuck that much. Well, maybe that oriental music sends me. By the way, where's the Scarlet Dawn, Mallard? Huh? Uh, Right down there on the corner. Come on. I'll buy you a double Mickey. Uh, no, thanks. I just had one. And listen, Candy, take a tip. Don't interfere with the work of the police. Don't worry about me, Mallard. And you take a tip, too. Next time you trail somebody, get yourself a pair of tennis shoes. <laughs> Yes, miss. You like a table? No, thanks. Uh, no. Something I can do? Hmm? Oh. Oh, yes, I'm... I'm a friend of Donna Dunham's. She wanted me to come over and tell you that she's feeling better. She'll be back at work tomorrow night. Well, that's good. Uh, business at the hot check stand, no good without her. Yeah. Yes, yeah, she's a great girl. By the way, I, I, I don't see her boyfriend tonight. Boyfriend? You know, the... 
The fellow who plays in the band? Oh, Donnie Andrini. No, he got night off. Oh, too bad. She wanted me to tell him, too. Yep, too bad. Oh, maybe you'll find him at the Lotus Hotel. He lived there. Oh, sure. The Lotus. Yes, I'll check there, and thank you very much. Rembrandt Watson speaking. Yes, I know. Now, look. Photographs taken at reasonable prices. I know, Rembrandt. Family I, groups I... and portraits especially also... Uh, Rembrandt, this is I, Candy Matson. Fine colored pictures of... What? Candy Matson? That's right. By all the furies of Zeus. Why did you have to call just now? I was wooing the muse that only Bacchus can create, probing the infinitesimal heights a soul can reach from the tear of the grape. And you have to call and spoil it all. Look, Rembrandt, uncross your eyes and listen to me. I shall listen, my lily, but undoubtedly I won't like it. What skullduggery are you up to now? I'm knee-deep in something that smells as high as the Oakland mudflat. A towering comparison. What is it? I can't tell you now, but I want you to do me a favor. Get your finest camera and go over to 27B Gresham Alley. Get inside and take all the pictures you can at the place. Won't I be intruding? No. There's a very attractive young lady there. Oh, how delightful. She's dead. How dull. I dislike intensely one-sided conversation. All right. What do I do then? Go back to your place and get me some prints as fast as you can. I go, but not willingly. Only for you would I forsake the mood I have achieved through prodigious application. Bully for you, laddie buck. I'll see you at your place in about an hour. Pardon me. Are, are you the night clerk? I ain't sitting bull. Yes, we have no rooms. Uh, I'm not here for a room. Oh? Well, uh, maybe there's something I can do for you. Yes. Uh, could you tell me if Mr. Danny Andrini is in? No, he isn't. As a matter of fact, I haven't seen him all day. Uh, y yes, I know. Th there's a reason. We had to take him to the hospital this morning. What? Yes. He's... Uh, He's uh, under observation for appendicitis. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So, I was wondering if you'd let me have his key. Huh? He wants me to bring him his portable radio. Oh, does he have one? Why, sir, did you ever know a musician who didn't own a portable radio? <laughs> well, I know, come to think of it. I... Yeah, yeah, here's the key. It's uh, room 418. Thank you. You're oh. very kind. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Start making like a private eye. Letters. Letters. Yes, over here. Look promising. A whole pile of. Well, let's try this one. Dear Danny, I don't know how to start this, but your accusations last night need some sort of answering. I'm not in love with Warren Roberts and never will be. He's just proven to be a very kind and gracious friend. You must realize that I have placed my singing career above everything else, and I want to... Well, leave us confront the issue, can we? Oh. Hello, you. Hello. I was wondering if I could be of any assistance. Oh, no, it it seems Mr. Andrini was out of his head. Uh -huh. I, I mean, he doesn't seem to have a portable radio. Oh. I'll, uh, I'll just be on my way. Oh, now, what's the rush? You don't have to leave right away. Wouldn't you like a drink or something? No, not right now. I, I am pressed for time. Oh. I tell you what, though. Huh? I'll be back later. Sure. Fine. When? Let's make it next Whitsuntide, huh? 
Goodbye. On my soul, I'd like to have the popcorn concession here tonight. Come in, come in. Rembrandt, you're a double-crosser. I, a double-crosser? Yes. My dear, you're mistaken. Oh? The only time I double-crossed was out in the country. I passed over a bridge, then I had to double-cross back. Oh, no. I found I'd left my knapsack with some rare vintage in it on the other side. What are you doing here? You haven't had time to get the pictures I wanted. That's just the point. To elucidate, I arrived at 27B Gresham Alley and found it to be a most loathsome location. That's beside the point. What happened? I couldn't get in. Oh, Rembrandt, I, I, I've done you a grave injustice. Of course you couldn't get in. Warren Roberts has the key. Who's this minion Roberts? I'll tell you later. We've got to work fast. Mallard sniffed something in the wrong key and the police will be in on the deal before long. Mallard, the gumshoe? That's right. I've just got to get pictures of the layout so I can study them. In my own fumbling fashion, Candy, my love, I have given birth to an idea. Even from you, Rembrandt, I'll take it. I'm grabbing at straws. Straws. Very effective with a tall, cool column. Never mind now. What's your idea? Let us hire ourselves to a locksmith. Present ourselves as man and wife, and a peasant will make us a key. Voila! Entree to the Madurie's apartment. No, Rembrandt, that'll never work. Oh, wait a minute. Three flats to the house. I used to live in just that kind of a house out on Fulton Street when I was a kid. A nauseating thought. Rembrandt, those flats are identical. If we can get into the flat above, we can get what we want. I think I fathom your reasoning, Candy. In other words, the living room is just the same. That's right. The dining room, likewise. Check. And the same goes for the bedroom, the kitchen, and even the, uh... That's right, even in there. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go slumming in Gresham Alley. Go ahead, Rembrandt. Ring the bell. Always I must do the labor. Oh, poo. Well, I hope we don't disturb the dead in the middle flat. You won't. From what I hear, she was done in sort of permanently. Oh, dear, there's no one at home. Come on, Candy. Let's return and see what Bacchus has to offer. No, wait. I thought I heard something. There, you see? Got all your flash bulbs? As they say in the old country, have I lost my marbles? Open the door. Beauty before age, you might be. Thank you, Randy. Kind of dark in here. What a peculiar aroma. Definitely smacks of the far east. Yes. Something you folks wanted? Chalk up, Candy. It's your cue. Why, uh, yes. May we come up? What do you want? Well, we're with a magazine. The Ha House Lovely. We want to take a few photographs of your place. At this hour? The working press is never shackled by the hands on a clock, sir. Sounds phony to me, but come on up. What do you want to take pictures of this beat-up joint for? Well, you, you see, it, it's comparison. The old and the new. We've already taken pictures of a flat similar to this, only it's been remodeled. This, well, this is perfect for the contrast. Mm. Uh, I guess it's all right. Go ahead. Uh, start with the hall, Rembrandt. Roger, my pretty. Let's see. This should be just about right. Mm-hmm. Now, the, uh, the bedroom. That should be off the hall here. Oh, yes. Uh, shoot from the door, Rembrandt. Can you get the entire room? Mm, not quite, but most of it. That'll do. Just a moment. Ah. Uh, there we are. You cats work fast. Uh, what was that? I said you work fast. Uh, yes. Now, in the bathroom, do you have a tub or a shower? Why, you... Why don't you see for yourself? No. On second thought, I, I think that's about all we need. But Candy, you said that we Come could... along, Rembrandt. And uh, thank you very much. Oh, uh, that's Rembrandt. okay. And don't slam the door. The lady downstairs is sound asleep. <laughs> 
I've got this thing licked. Are you referring to this case or my desire to return to the arms of Bacchus? That I could never lick. I'm talking about the case. But I need help, Rembrandt. I'm here. No. That's not enough. I need the big, strong arm of the law. Oh, no. Candy, you traitor. I hate to admit it, but I need somebody like Mallard. Am I being paid? Hmm? Oh, no. It's the wicked genie. Yikes, it's a gumshoe. Yeah, in person. Mallard, how did you get here? I took your advice and bought some tennis shoes. <laughs> All right, Spill, what goes on? Been following you around till I'm punchy. Start talking, Candy. Okay, so you heard me. I do need your help, Mallard. Badly. There was a young girl murdered yesterday at 27B Gresham Alley. Is that the place you just came from? That's right. Why don't we ever hear of these things? Oh, I get exclusive rights. Anyway, I think I have the whole deal figured out. You can have full credit, Mallard, but you've got to take my advice. Uh, it hurts, but go ahead. Now go back to 27C, Gresham Alley. That's the top flat. Mm -hmm. You'll find a character there named Danny Andrini. Uh, take him. Then get out to 5711 Pacific Street as fast as you can. Uh, all right, I'll do it. But, Caddy, so help me, if this is a foul-up on you, the new look with stripes is going to be very fashionable. She knows what she's doing, Mallard. When you get back to Gresham Alley, just tell Mr. Andrini that you're from House Lovely. He'll adore you. <laughs> Doing out here on Pacific, Candy. This is out of our league. All of a sudden, I've become socially conscious. Come on, Montgomery, enter the door. Ah, right on cue. I beg your pardon. Did you ring? Uh, no, Montgomery. We, we crossed the moat and used a battering ram. I'm sorry, young lady. Mr. Roberts doesn't wish to be disturbed. Look, Montgomery, remember me? I was here earlier this evening. Mr. Roberts and I had a martini together. Martinis? Well, it was worth a safari out here after all. Uh-uh. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, miss. I didn't recognize you at first. Uh, yes, do come in, won't you? And the light dawned. If you'll just wait in the drawing room, miss, I'll inform Mr. Roberts of your presence. Thank you very much, Montgomery. I used to know a chap like that in the British Army. By continual groveling and studied abjectedness, he worked his way up to the rank of a private. <laughs> Thanks, Rembrandt. That's the first laugh I've had tonight. What's the pitch, Candy? I don't get it. You will in a minute. Shh. You hear the patter of little feet. Miss Matson, what's the idea? I thought you were going to check with me by phone. Mr. Roberts, this thing is bigger than either of us. I just couldn't wait. <coughs> uh, is there a martini in the house? I'll have Montgomery serve in just a moment. I don't think there will be time, Mr. Roberts. Well, where is she? Upstairs. You really loved her, didn't you? Madly. That just about describes it. Madly. And while you were, uh, shall we say, sponsoring her career, you thought she was playing around with Danny Andrini as well. Yes, she was. You're wrong, Robert. I have a letter from Donna Dunham to Danny Andrini. In effect, she told him to blow, skedaddle, vamoose. What? That's right. So it seems we have a slight case of mistaken murder on our hands, doesn't it? Yes. On one hand. On the other, I have two in mind that will be deliberate. You asked for it, Miss Matson. Too bad you had to bring your friend along. I wouldn't if I were you, Robert. The writer has a pistol. I thought you said he served martinis. This isn't exactly a social moment. I know how you private eyes work, your lone wolves. You confide in no one. So with a pull of the finger, I erase all evidence. Just like this. He's dead. Oh, I'm really grateful to you, but where on earth did you come from? Like I say, Candy, 
You just can't beat these tennis shoes. Well, that clears everything up except for one thing. Where do we go now for the martinis? And that's how it happens. My phone rings and I'm into the darndest message you ever heard of. Sure, Roberts killed her. He was jealous. And I knew I was on the right track when Rembrandt said the apartment above Donna Dunham's smelled like the Far East. It was tobacco odor, the same Turkish aroma I had smelled in Robert's home out on Pacific Street. Danny Andrews? Well, he was waiting for Roberts to return. He was going to kill him. He knew that Roberts had rented the flat above Dunham for uh, sponsoring purposes. Donna was a nice kid. She was just caught in the middle, flat. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. This is the start of a mystery. Our main character is a San Francisco girl detective, Candy Matson. There are others in the show, too. An Inspector Mallard, a gent who calls himself Rembrandt Watson, a cowboy, a dude ranch owner, and a gal the casting agency assured us was a dowager, slightly boozy. There are a few other voices along the way, too. I think that has all the makings of a good mystery show, don't you? Well, let's go on from here and find out. So, here's Candy Matson. <laughs> Like the man just said, this is the start of a mystery. Christmas had me completely tuckered out. No one had invited me to the Rose Bowl game or the East-West at Kezar, so I decided to make like a bear and hibernate over New Year's. It worked out perfectly because, as my old friend Rembrandt Watson put it, You wish to greet 1950 in some remote spot? Is that the idea, Doug? That's the idea, Ducky. I have the perfect place for you. A dude ranch, reasonable, just on the other side of Sonoma, in the Valley of the Moon. Valley of the Moon. New Year's Eve in the Valley of the Moon. Rembrandt, that sends me. Good. Maybe it can send us both. I have a commission to take some pictures up there for a brochure they're putting out. I have to be there tomorrow afternoon. Yes. I see you're nibbling at the bait. I shall be blunt. Why don't you drive me up? You've won your point. I'll pick you up tomorrow at what time? Let us be spectacular and say high noon. High noon. And uh, do bring some cash, will you, girl? I'm a little short. I thought you were going up there on a commission. Yes, I am but they have some simply divine one-arm devices. And? And there goes my commission. Naturally, a girl has to look right to welcome in the New Year. That gave me the perfect excuse to squander a few hard-earned dollars and cents on some lovely clothes that didn't make sense but cost dollars. The afternoon was aging gracefully, a little gray here and a wrinkle or two there. So I stopped for a parfait, very dry and no olives. With that mission accomplished, I headed back over Kearney Street. And as I wheeled past Portsmouth Square in the Hall of Justice, I realized I hadn't seen my chum Mallard in quite some time. Inspector Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. A very smart cop who can smell a clue a mile away. But when it comes to me, he very conveniently carries his own fog around. Well, Candy, my little cupcake. Mallard, dear... You called me your little cupcake. Sure, it's still the Christmas season. Let's be charitable, I always say. What do you always say? In a situation like this, nothing. I just exude a stream of steam from the top of my head. Very cute. What brings you around our boarding house? You, darn it. I thought you might like to know I'm going away for a week. What did they get you on? Petty theft? Yeah, and they got me as I tried to make my getaway on a tricycle. <laughs> But for your information, Inspector, I'm, I'm spending my New Year's Eve up in the Valley of the Moon. Oh, want to get away from it all, huh? That's right. 
You in particular. In that case, may I get your midwinter vacation off to a flying start? You can try. How? I'm not working tonight. How's about a movie? You've got yourself a date. What's playing? Tex, Tex Acuff. Acuff. <laughs> That's what I thought. Where's Tex and his faithful horse Mustard playing this time? Oh, at the plaza. Mm. And the pictures of Pip, too. I bet. I read all about it. Yeah. Hot lead over Laredo. Uh, uh, look, here's the ad in the paper. Oh, I can't wait to see uh, it. Uh, Show me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. A searing epic of the West's wild grandeur. Men as rugged as the mountains. Oui. A singing saga of scorching bullets, strumming guitars, and supple senoritas. Uh -uh. And starring the champ of the cowboys, Tex, Tex Acuff. Acuff. Oh, what more can one ask in a motion picture? Popcorn. Oh, we'll have that, too. I went home, did some packing for the trip the next day, fixed something to eat, and then changed into my spurs that jingle jangle for Tex Acuff. Mallard arrived, we took off. We got to the early show, so we managed to get some good seats. Of course, he wasn't kidding about the popcorn. He got a great big bag of that. We fumbled our way down the darkened aisle and found a place to sit. The movie was almost oh, over. Oh, Tex, the whole thing looks like a gosh dang frame up to me. They must have snuck off with them head of cattle and old ring the in you. Yep, all right. Here, Candy. Right. These all seats right. are okay. Oh. They must have gone oh. that way, all right. Sure. Oh, 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 sorry, lady. So am I, Pete. What happened to Tex? Last time I seen her, she was leaving. Seats are okay. Oh, uh, some have some popcorn. Rubber, no, no. I no, wonder thanks. where the sheriff is. He said he was going to be riding by directly. Oh, probably. Oh, sure. Oh, 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 what? Um, I said sure oh, is good popcorn. Oh, oh sure you don't want some? What? I said, are you sure you don't want some popcorn? I keep saying no. No, thank you. I don't want any popcorn, my dear. If you'll pardon me, I'm going home and catch this on television. I understand your After hot lead over Laredo, I suffered through six reels of a bouncy college picture. The freshmen looked like holdovers from the early days of the war. Then a newsreel, then a cartoon, then the trailer, then again Tex Aka. So we got out about midnight, and I drove Mallard back to the Hall of Justice. As he got out of the car... Oh, well. Oh, now that's what I call sharp dialogue. On leaving the lady, all he can say is, oh, well. Oh, nothing personal, Candy. <laughs> now he laughed at me. Well, I was just thinking, uh, you're going up to the Valley of the Moon for a rest. Is that the idea? Well, yes. That and trying to get away from Tex Acuff. Uh, I know you too well, Candy. You're not going to have any rest. Uh, look at the headline on that paper in the newsstand there. Man missing in Sonoma mystery. And Sonoma can have it. Mallard, dear, if I so much as step inside the Sonoma city limits, you can come and lead me away quietly. You know something? I'm going to remember that. <laughs> Mallard waved goodbye and went inside. I didn't like the way he said that. But I had other things to think about, such as getting home and getting some sleep. So I did. And in the morning, I drove over to California Street, picked up Rembrandt. We headed out across the Golden Gate Bridge up toward Sonoma. The Valley of the Moon wasn't too far. A couple of hours of leisurely driving with time out for readjustments. And you're there. Then another eight miles north and east, and there was the Dude Ranch. This is it, dear. What do you think of it? Perfect. Just perfect. Why, Rembrandt, dear, it's a real ranch. Of course, dear, but going concern. They only take in guests as a sideline. Oh, here comes a man. I imagine that's Mr. Lawrence, the owner. Oh, well, I'll shut off the motor. Good morning. How do you do, sir? Would you be Mr. Lawrence, for chance? Yes, and you? Watson. Rembrandt Watson. I'm here to take some pictures for you as we discussed via the Dell system. Oh, yes, Watson. Right on time. That's good. Oh, Candy. May I present Mr. Lawrence? owner of the double L, uh, Miss Matson. How do you do? Miss Matson was wondering if she could get accommodations for about a week, Mr. Lawrence. What? Now, wait a minute, Watson. I'm paying you a substantial fee for this job, and I won't get stuck with non-paying guests. Oh, I think you're laboring under a misapprehension. Hold it, Rembrandt. Look, Mr. Lawrence, I'm here as a commercial guest. I'm not asking for any favors. And I doubt if I'd stay here now if you got down on your bended knuckles. Oh, now, wait a second. I didn't mean it just that way. I, I apologize. 
It's only that, uh, well, I've had some tough luck with people lately who seem to be only too intent on beating me out of their bills. Uh, please, Miss Matson, excuse me. I, I just jumped to conclusions, that's all. I think you set a new record for the jump. Oh, forget it, Dove. Do. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, do you have room for me, Mr. Lawrence? Why, yes, yes, of course. A delightful cabin just in back of the ranch house. Not being prepared, it'll take about an hour to get it in shape. Will that be all right? Yes, sure. We can eat in the meantime. Fine. I'll get one of the boys to fetch your luggage. Oh, you can park over there under the old stables. Oh, no garage? Well, again, I have to apologize, Miss Matson. The garage is overloaded now. We have a sheriff's posse up here. The owner of the ranch next to mine disappeared yesterday afternoon. The sheriff is searching the entire vicinity around here. <laughs> Dove, are you all right? <laughs> well, speak to me, girl. What is it? I'm all right. I just happened to think of something Mallard once said last night. <laughs> I pushed my assembled horsepower into the stables where they belonged, and Rembrandt took me by the arm and steered me into the ranch house. It was a beautiful place, a tall cathedral-like living room with a crackling fireplace about the size of Dante's Inferno at one end. Off to this one side of the fireplace was a cozy little bar. The sun was just going over the yard arm, so I figured an old-fashioned would be quite in order. Old-fashioned was right. Behind the bar was the personification of an old-fashioned cowboy. Real shafts, a leathery face, and little squint wrinkles around his eyes. Well, howdy, Tick. It seems like as if I done saw you in a movie last night. Uh, howdy yourself, ma'am. Nope. Must have been two other cowboys. I've been working here at the Double L for almost five years. My mistake, partner. Matson's the handle. What's yourn? <laughs> Is that the way cowboys talk, ma'am? <laughs> yeah, Hollywood and vine variety. <laughs> I'm glad to know you. Call me Jeff, Miss Matson. Check. This is Rembrandt Watson. Rembrandt? Jeff. Are those shoulders sewn in, or are they real? <laughs> I'm afraid they're real. Hiya, Mr. Watson. You riding herd on all those bottles back there, Jeff? Yep, for better or worse. Chang, our regular bartender, took powder on us day before yesterday. Uh-oh. Seems like he picked a bad time to do a run -out. Oh, you mean the missing jet from Glen Valley? Glendale? Yeah, that's the ranch next to ours. Yeah, I understand the police are on the lookout for Chang, but he didn't do it. He's a good, honest Chinese boy. Even so, it's a bad time to disappear. Oh, I admit it doesn't sound good. Well, if you folks won't mind the efforts of an amateur dispenser, what can I do for you? An old-fashioned for me, Jeff. Well, that I can try. <laughs> From now on, it gets easier. Rembrandt only wants a Coke. Well, I can sure fix that all right. Uh-oh. What's wrong? Here comes the Duchess. The Duchess? Yeah, one of our guests. Oh. She's been out here about two weeks, and she can go through distilled spirits faster than a buzzsaw through mushy pine. And I hope you're prepared to talk. Always, Jeff. Always. Hello, my dear. You just arrived, haven't you? Uh, mentally or physically? Oh, oh my! A sense of humor, too. I, I shall enjoy your company. Are you staying long? Well, I, I'm not sure now. My plans are rather indefinite. Oh, you'll love it here, Miss... Uh... Met. And may I present Mr. Rembrandt Watson? Charmed, I'm sure. As of now, me life has come in. Oh, you delightful lad. Uh, Jeff, dear boy, make me just a little nip of the old favorites, will you? Sure. One painkiller coming up. Ah, here's your old-fashioned, Miss Matson. Thanks. Mr. Watson, your coat. Thanks, sir. Young lady, you must be an actress. You look like what? Well, no, I'm not. I used to be an actress, a mm. famous one. Mm -hmm. I toured all over the continent with the greatest of stars, the finest of plays. Mm. I was the toast of London, Berlin, Vienna. Yes, but I... I, I never... had kings and princesses uh. worshipping at my feet. Oh. I was once the vortex of an international incident. But no matter... Those days are gone forever now. I... And here's your tonic, Duchess. You what? Oh, thank you, Jeff. Well, as we used to say, here's to cry. What was that? It's a perfect toast. We have quite a mystery in this part of the country, young lady. And so I keep hearing. I can't understand. Mr. Ferguson had everything to live for. Mr. Ferguson? The man who owned Glen Valley. Wealthy, good-looking... In the best of health. You seem to know quite a bit about the gentleman, Duchess. Only what I read in the newspapers, and I can't understand it. Well, as I said, here's to crime. 
We dallied at the bar for a few more moments. Then Jeff informed me that lunch was ready and Rembrandt and I ate. We managed to duck the Duchess. I don't think I could have taken her with food. After lunch, Lawrence showed me to my cabin. It was, as he said, delightful with a warming flame in the fireplace. It was cheery and comfy and I felt completely at home. Lawrence left to talk to Rembrandt. They were going to discuss the pictures he wanted taken. I felt like going riding, so I changed into my jeans and started to leave. But as I did... <gasps> oh, sorry, Miss Matson. I didn't mean to frighten you. Oh, well, you did, Jim. Oh, I was just about to knock when you opened the door. Oh, that's okay. Was there something you wanted? Well, you're in riding clothes, and that answers my question. The question being? Well, were you going riding? <laughs> you see, the boss wanted to know if you were going riding, and if so, did you want some company? I usually show the guests around the acres. Well, yes, that'd be wonderful. And, uh... How long do you want to be out, Miss Matson? About three hours or so. Sure. In that case, we'll take the deluxe tour over across the back 60 and up through Manzanita Canyon. You know, when we get up to the top of Iron Mountain, you can see the whole valley of the moon. That's for me, Jeff. Let's hit the leather. <laughs> Jeff was obviously born to the saddle and came into this world teething on a tether rein. You couldn't tell where the horse left off, and Jeff began a real rider. We nosed out through the clump of ranch buildings and on into open space. I had a fine horse under me, and I really felt like I was living. We'd been riding about an hour when we came across a little stream. Jeff indicated we should stop and water the horses. How long have you been a cowboy, Jeff? Oh, about as long as I can remember. Around here? No, up around Montana. Then little by little, I gradually drifted further west. Get upon the Valley of the Moon about five years ago. Fell in love with it. I've been here ever since. Reckon I'll stay here, too. No, I don't blame you. Excuse me if I seem to be full of questions, Jeff. Well, that's what I'm here for, ma'am. Good. Because I've got a couple more. What's up that little draw there on the other side of the creek? Mm, nothing but a tangle of manzanita. Scrub oak and brush. Pretty hard to get through there, hmm? Hard. It's impossible. Well, I've seen chipmunks get fouled up in that draw. Uh-huh. Then how come those boot prints are going right up there? Boot prints? I don't see any. Well, hey, you're right. Either boot prints are the result of shoes with Cuban heels. Well, now, there's a strange one. Exactly what I thought, too. Say, you know, something just dawned on me. Matson, didn't I see your pictures in the Frisco papers a couple of weeks back? San Francisco. Big pardon? San Francisco. Oh, yeah, San Francisco. Excuse me. Well, sure. You know, the way you was asking those questions just now, <laughs> it hit me. You're a detective. I'm afraid you got me, partner. Uh oh, wait a minute, Miss oh. Matson. Listen. Let's duck, Jeff. Too late now. What the? Well, who there? What are you doing over this way, Jeff? Hi, boss. Well, sir, you give us quite a little start. You haven't answered my question. Oh, we just stopped to wallow the horses, Mr. Lawrence. Miss Matson here's a mighty fine rider. She wanted to make the big circle of the ring. Well, you certainly picked a fine time to do it. Whoa. The sheriff's posse is out around this way. You're liable to get shot. Now get back to the ranch, pronto. Just a moment, Mr. Lawrence. You've been uncivil ever since I got here, and I don't like to be dictated to. It's like being on board ship, Miss Matson. The captain is the law. I'm the owner of this property, and you'll do as I say. Now get moving, both of you. And if you don't like my attitude, you can leave any time you want. Leave? Now? Yes. Oh, no, Mr. Lawrence. I'm beginning to find your ranch extremely interesting. <laughs> Jeff and I wheeled our horses about and sifted back to the ranch house. I looked back a couple of times, but there was no sign of Lawrence. I was mad, and Jeff must have sensed it because he was smart enough to keep his mouth closed. As I dismounted at the stables and headed for the house, he waved me a forlorn adios and disappeared. Just as I went through the door, I was greeted by Rembrandt. Oh, there you are, Dove. I was about to institute a searching party for you. Oh, I was safe enough until I gained the grips with a thing called my own temper. What have you been doing, Ducky? I've had a most delightful afternoon, Candy dear. I've been playing canasta with the Duchess. Canasta? Ooh, you don't know how to play canasta. Well, I know that, and you know it, but I don't think the Duchess does. <laughs> she celebrates each hand with a hefty pull on her bitters. <laughs> Why'd you manage to make any sense out of the game? Well, that has me puzzled, too. All I do is put down some cards, any cards, and she'd congratulate me. <laughs> Maybe you've got a green thumb for the game. Incidentally, I thought you were going to be taking pictures this afternoon. Called off on account of the law. Hmm? Mr. Lawrence had to ride out into the lone prairie and deliver a phone message to the sheriff. He's making like ghost riders in the sky out there. 
Do go and change, dear. You smell of horses. Yes, I know. Oh, and incidentally, we're to have a soiree this evening. Two more guests arrived. The cook tells me there's to be a little entertainment after dinner. Good. Around here, anything will be an improvement. I didn't tell Rembrandt I was going to change, so it wasn't a fib when I stayed in my jeans. I went back to the stables, got the boy to rig me another horse, and headed out toward that creek again. I rode faster this time, because I'd noticed something else there besides the footprints. It was a battered ten-gallon hat on the far side of the creek with studded initials J.F. on the crown. But when I got there, the cupboard was bare, but good. Not only was the ten-gallon hat gone, but the boot prints had been completely obliterated. I stayed for another few minutes of study and frustration and then went back to the ranch. I changed, met Rembrandt, had dinner, and then we relaxed in the living room. Oh, Dove, I'm so full. This outdoor living makes me ravenous. Outdoors? <laughs> I don't think you've stepped out of this building since we got here. Well, then it's the thought of outdoor living that does it. <laughs> oh, there are the new arrivals over by the fire. Uh, did you meet them? No. They looked at me as though I might soil their escutcheon, whatever that is. <laughs> I can see what you mean. Hi, folks. Do you enjoy, enjoy your dinner? Oh, hello, Jeff. Yes, it was wonderful. Uh, has anybody seen Mr. Lawrence or the Duchess? We haven't seen Lawrence, no. The Duchess is over there writing a letter. Oh. Well, I hope you'll all drop around in about an hour. I'm going to do some singing and a little guitar plucking. Is there anything you don't do, Jeff? No, very little. But none of them too darn good either. Sure, we'll be here, won't we, Rembrandt? Well, oh, yes, I go with three diamonds and a joke card. Jeff left, Rembrandt snoozed, and I threw a wrap around my shoulders and took a stroll around the patio. The air felt good. I went over to my cabin, picked up some cigarettes, and started back. But as I came close to the cabin opposite mine... Oh. It was the Duchess. I'd recognize those tones and groans anywhere. Oh. Duchess? Yeah. This is Candy Matson. Are, are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. Touch of indigestion, I should imagine. Oh, is there anything I can do or can I get you something? Oh, what a dear thing you are. No, I'll be all right. I have these attacks all the time. You run along and enjoy yourself. Jeff is going to sing. He's such a dear boy. But you're sure you'll be okay? Yes. Yes, dear. You go along. Oh, here. Now, let me put a blanket over you. Oh. There, and take off your shoes. You'll be ever so much more comfortable. Oh, you're so sweet. So pretty. You remind me of myself when I was young. Thank you. Thank you so much. I tucked the old girl in and left her to dream of the past and went back to the ranch house. Jeff was just pulling up a chair in front of the fireplace. Well, you'll have to understand, folks, I'm not a singer. I don't pretend to be. I just warble along the way I feel. Now, is there any particular kind of cowboy tune you'd like to hear? No, Jeff. Why don't you just sing a favorite of yours? Good idea. Just do what comes naturally. Okay, you asked for it. Let's see. Here's one I think you might like. Oh, bury me not on the low prairie. Where the coyotes howl and the wind blows free in a narrow grave, just sit by three. But Barry, oh, hi, boss. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. Go right on with what you were doing. No, Mr. Lawrence. You arrived just in time. The entertainment's over. What? What are you talking about, Miss Matson? I said the show's over. Is the sheriff around? Yes, he and his men are outside. They're just leaving for the night. You better call him back, right now. The Duchess is dead in her cabin. What? Poisoned. Wait a minute. Sheriff! Sheriff Hop! Is that you, Lord? That's right. Can you and your men come back for a spell? Seems we have more trouble. Okay. We'll be over as soon as we tie up the horse. Now then, what's this all about? Well, I could tell you, Lawrence, but I think it'd be more proper coming from the star himself. Don't you think so, Jeff? 
<laughs> Looks like this is it, doesn't it? You know, you're smart, Miss Matson. Like they say in that ad, never underestimate the power of a woman. That's right. That letter the Duchess wrote proves your point. What? How'd you get hold of that letter? I thought I... Oh, she wrote a duplicate. Is that it? Like you say, never underestimate the power of a woman. Wait a moment. I don't understand what's going on here. Go ahead, Miss Madison. You tell me. Looks like I'm not the star any longer. Well, Lawrence, up to about two weeks ago, you had as nice and gentle a cowpoke folk working for you as there ever was. Then the Duchess arrived. She wasn't kidding when she claimed to have mingled with nobility, important people. As a matter of fact, she had an inside tip about your ranch and the one next door, Ferguson's place, Glen Valley. Didn't you receive a fantastic offer for your property from a big wine company just recently, Lawrence? Why, yes, I did. So did Ferguson. They were going to merge the two places and make it one of the world's largest vineyards. I didn't know about that part of it. But the Duchess did. She wanted in on the ground floor. That's why she came out here. She tried, tried to talk business with Ferguson, but he'd have none of it. So in one of her boozy moments, she hit upon the idea of doing away with Ferguson. But she didn't have the nerve to go through with it. That's when she approached Jeff here and cut him in on the deal. Jeff was tired of the poor but honest cowboy routine, saw a chance to make some heavy sugar, and went along with the gag. Right, Jeff? She's got it straight so far, boss. Jeff, I, I can't believe my ears. Oh, that's nothing. Just wait a while. Jeff and the Duchess were out riding one afternoon when, by chance, Ferguson rode up, too, just where the boundaries of the two ranches meet. While the Duchess talked to Ferguson, Jeff sneaked around and back and bashed in his head. They hauled him up to that draw where you bumped into us this afternoon. I know now why you ordered us out of there. On the other side of that snarl of brush and manzanita, there's a quicksand pit. That is now Ferguson's permanent residence. This is terrible. Terrible. In the hurry to dispose of your late neighbor, they left shoe prints along the bank of the creek. And they also overlooked Ferguson's hat with his initials on it. I'm mighty glad you came by when you did, Lawrence. After I had noticed the boot prints, I... I think Jeff was going to dump me into the quicksand, too. <laughs> You're right again. After the boss sent us back in, I sort of figured it'd get to you tonight instead. And then, Lawrence, you were going to be next. Because in your will, you would name Jeff as your sole heir. Is that right? That, that's right. I, I love him like a son. Then the Duchess and Jeff could have swung a hard bargain with that wine outfit. All very smooth, except for one thing. One thing? I'm kind of curious about that one thing, Miss Matson. Alcohol, Jeff. It's not only lifting to begin with, but also acts as a depressing agent. The Duchess had been imbibing all day, and after dinner she arrived at that point of depression, realized what a horrible thing she had done, and she wrote the full story about the wine company and Jeff's duplicity and made a copy. You were afraid of that yourself, Jeff. That's when you went out and slipped the old girl a lethal Mickey. I heard her groaning and went in to investigate. She said it was indigestion, but I knew differently. Her breath. And I knew, too, that she'd be dead within five minutes. Then I saw her shoes. Cuban heels with mud caked on the inner side of the arch. That's when I had a hunch the letter she was writing had a definite meaning. You overlooked it, Jeff. I found it. Where only a woman would think of looking. Tucked inside her bosom. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lauren. I had you figured wrong from the start. I was the one who was wrong. You aren't hard at all. You're soft as putty. <laughs> well, Jeff, here comes the sheriff. Yeah, so I see. Well, I'm ready for him. You can't beat a royal flush with a pair of deuces. Or should I say, dunces. Ah, oh, go, there won't be any fuss. And all of a sudden, it dawns on me. People should accept their luck. If you're born to be a cowboy, just stay a cowboy. And if you're born a millionaire, don't fight that either. Well, goodbye, Miss Matson. And I'm glad the boss happened along when he did, because I don't think quick stand would look good on you. Like Jeff said, he went quietly. No trouble. Too bad he wasn't content to be just a ranch hand, simple and unspoiled. Because as Rembrandt had noticed, he did have wonderful shoulders. He played the guitar, he sang, and he made fine old fashioned. All in all, a very nice guy, except for two vices. Hitting from the behind and poisoning. The Valley of the Moon? Oh, I'll go back. It's lovely. After all, one man with a snarled brain can't undo the work of the original master painter. 
Listen again next week at this same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Metzen, Yukon 28209. <laughs> Heard tonight were Helen Klebe as the Duchess, Lou Tobin as Lawrence, and Clancy Hayes as Jeff. Henry Leff as Inspector Mallard and Jack Thomas as Rembrandt. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Sound effects were created by Bill Brownell and Jay Rendon. Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's story are entirely fictitious, and any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. You are tuned for the stars on NBC. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Got an old corpse kicking around you want identified? Know of any good murders you want solved? We've got just the girl for you. Her name is Candy Matson. Mighty cute, too. She fills out a size 12 suit to just the right proportions. Soft blonde hair, two sparkling blue eyes, and all in all, she looks as though she might have stepped right off a Varga calendar. And what's more, she's a private eye. You scoff? You ridicule? I'll let you see for yourselves. Listen, she's talking on the phone right now. Hello, Candy Matson. Hello, Miss Matson. I'm afraid you don't know me. That makes it even. You don't know me. Let's go from there. I've read about you in the papers, Miss Amatson. You handle confidential cases. That's right. However, there's a little matter of a fee involved. Yes, yes, I know. I can pay. That's item number one. Now to item number two. What's the confidential case? I can't possibly tell you on the phone, Miss Amatson. I said it was confidential. Mm, okay. Where do you want to talk? I am the proprietor of a restaurant, the Charlemagne in North Beach. Oh, yeah. I ate there once. Oh. That's nice. No, it wasn't. I didn't like the food. Oh. However, I'll overlook it. Do you want to talk in about an hour? That will be fine, Miss Matson. Good. And your name would be... Martinello. Carlo Martinello. Okay, Mr. Martinello. And uh, have some ink in your pen. It costs money just to talk. I probably sounded rough and commercial, but you have to be in this racket. Most people look in a private eye as a musician. They invite you to a party and expect you to bring your harp for free. But uh uh-uh. I learned the hard way a long time ago. So now they pay in advance and take their chances later. That's the way it was with this Martinello. I was at home in my penthouse on Telegraphy a lot on the porch taking a sun bath. When the phone rings and it's this Carlo character. That part was all right because I can always use new customers. But what made me mad was the fact that I had to stop listening to the 49ers belt the bejabers out of the Cleveland Browns at Keysar Stadium. But I followed through and uncovered a couple of very done-in bodies along the way. Do you like the grotesque in your whodunit? Then follow me and we'll tiptoe lightly through the tibbets, the ponds, and the baccalonies. Because part of the story unfolds at the opera house. Reluctantly, I dressed into something Charlemagne-ish turned off the 49ers Cleveland game and went down to talk to Martinello. His place was typical, located on Powell Street, a garish neon sign, and as you walked in, the air place was air-conditioned by eau de garlique. Yes, miss. You wish a table? I wish a table, yes. With the right party, I'm looking for the owner. I am the owner. I am Candy Matson. Oh, Miss Matson. Walk this way, please. <sighs> if I could walk that way, I'd revive vaudeville. Pardon? Uh, where is your office? Right over here. Allow me. After you, signorina. Thank you, senor. Here, sit down, please. Thanks. Now, Martinello, what's on your mind? 
always, all my life, I have run a very nice, respectable place. Mm -hmm. Until this morning. What's with this morning? I go down to the basement. My icebox is down there. That is where I keep all my meat. So, you wanted some ground round. Oh, no, no. I... Perhaps I'd better show you. Please, you will come with me. Martinello led the way out of his office and down a flight of stairs. A cold blast hit my face. A musty aroma smothered my nostrils, and if I had had a phobia about darkness, I'd have ducked out then. But I followed the guy, and we ended up in front of a refrigerator about the size of an inquisition chamber. He opened the door, and it was the usual restaurant icebox, choice legs of lamb hanging from hooks, potential fillets, and thick New York cuts. The box was cold, and I started to shiver. Not from the refrigeration, though, because over in the corner was a man. He looked like something out of a long-lost Arctic expedition. He had a long, flowing mustache, every bristle of which was coated with ice. He was quite frozen and quite dead. I slammed the door shut and reeled out. The sight had staggered my thought processes. Martinello reached over by a salami slicing table and turned on a Mazda, a weak affair that cast dim shadows about the damp basement. Is that your little surprise? Yes, Mr. Matson. That is what I was greeted with this morning. Have you notified the police? Oh, no, no, no. Why not? As I told you, I have run a very respectable place. And, too, that is why I am hiring you. You can get in trouble, you know. Yes, yes, that is why you must help me. Please, please, Miss Matson, say you will help me. I will pay you anything you say. <sighs> I stick my neck out in the strangest places. Now it's a refrigerator. Okay, Martinello, $2,000. What? Make up your mind. Either I freeze your assets or the police find your frozen friend. Yes. All right. Come. I give you the money now. Now we're getting somewhere. What about him? Oh, he'll keep. He's on ice. Well, this was one for the books. Refrigeration the ugly way. I had to ask a few questions if I was to get anywhere. Such as like... Do you know the guy? No. Had you ever seen him before? No. Who was the last one to close the icebox last night? I was. Does it lock from the inside? Unfortunately, yes. I was getting places like Wiley was with Hauser. It was inevitable. I had to take my courage in my hand and go down and look at that thing again. There it was. A male Mona Lisa etched in ice. This time I looked closer. I had to... And as I did, I realized I wasn't going to get any identification because this guy was a study in crimson. Underneath all that coating of ice, he was dressed in a devil's costume. I slammed the door once again and went upstairs. There I gave Martinello strict orders not to do a thing. Usually in cases like this, you have to wait for a break. They come along like a forcing hand in poker. So I went home to do some thinking. As I arrived, there was an old friend of mine, Rembrandt Watson. Hello, Dove. I'd almost given up. Rembrandt, how did you get in? Your door was open, dear. I took the liberty of coming in. Oh, sure, that's okay. How are things, Candy? All right, I guess. I'm kind of bush, though. I feel about as devaluated as a British pound. You look wonderful, Dove. What's wrong? I've got a deal, but I don't know where to start. Anything I can help you with? No, thanks, Rembrandt. If I told you about it, you wouldn't believe it. I've never doubted you in the past, dear. I know. Well, I was just called in by a minestrone merchant in North Beach. The guy is stuck with a corpse. Well, that's about par for the course. The deceased had been sealed in the icebox overnight. I've never seen one like that before. That's the way it is, dear. Many are called, but few are frozen. Oh, get out of here. But, Dove, I just got here. I know, but I've got to change and get down to see Mallard. I'll wait for you, Candy. I haven't seen the gumshoe since before me vacation. All right. I'll be with you in a few moments. I did a fast change, and Rembrandt and I climbed into my car, and we dropped off Telegraph Hill on Don Kearney Street. The Hall of Justice, where Mallard hangs his star, is only a few blocks away, so we made it in about five minutes. Inspector Ray Mallard, homicide, San Francisco police. A lovable, shaggy dog type of character. Very keen with the crime, but dumb with the dame. Me, for instance. 
If I want him to say yes, he says no, and vice versa. Well, my ever-loving candy. What's new in the private eye business? Very little. How's the legitimate flatfoot record? Oh, we're holding our archers up. Well, and Rembrandt, I haven't seen you since Pup was a Hector. Please, Inspector, you're metting your mixapause. Who writes this dialogue? I'm pretty weak, I know. What's on your mind, Candy? A character named Carlo Martinello. Have you got anything on him? <laughs> What's so funny, Mallory? <laughs> nothing, except I eat lunch there about every day of the week. Well, answer my question. Well, there's nothing on Martinello. Arrested a couple of times during Prohibition. He was dabbling in grappa a lot under the table. Have you got a case against the guy, Detective Matson? Oh, cut it out. No, seriously. Why do you want to check on the guy, Candy? No reason. Just thought I'd ask. Uh-huh. Well, Martinello's okay. Just trying to make a living. Only thing I don't like, he loves to sing to his customers. <laughs> That'd be enough to bankrupt him right there. Anything else I can do? No, that takes care of everything. I tell you what, I'm through in about an hour. I'll take you up to Martinello's for dinner. You can see for yourself. No, 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 that, that, that's all right. Okay, Candy, give. Why, Mallard, dear, what on earth do you mean? You know something about something. I want in. Mallard, and, and I want you to believe this. I mean it sincerely. If I knew something, you'd be the last to know about it. He's got something there. Come now, believe us a while. I hate to do things like that to Mallard. He's been of great help to me in the past. More than once, he's saved my life. But on a deal like this, you have to play it close. After all, a girl has to make a living. For the first time in a long time, I was completely baffled as to where to start. Something had to be done about that cadaver in the icebox, but what? While I was beetling my eyebrows, Rembrandt invited me up to his place for tea. He lives on California Street, just down away from old St. Mary's and only a bail bond broker's reach from the Hall of Justice. So I accepted. You do forgive the looks of the place, Candy, dear. I had a meeting my philatelist group last night. Philatelists? The stamp collectors, dear. Well, I know what they are, but I didn't think they could make such a mess. You don't know philatelists. <laughs> Sit down, though. Make yourself comfortable. I shan't be a moment. That's all right. And Candy, dear, why the wrinkles? I've got cause for wrinkles. This chap in the icebox, Rembrandt, there's something I didn't tell you. He was dressed in a devil's costume. There, there, dear. Your tea will ready in just a minute. You'll feel better. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. What are you going to do, Candy? I don't know. I can't leave him in that refrigerator forever. Well, get him out, dear. I hate to think of a corpse catching pneumonia. Oh, excuse me, Candy. Help yourself to the tea. Mm -hmm. How do you do, Rembrandt Watson Enterprises? <laughs> Quiet, darling. Who? Oh, hello, Templeton. How are all your steamships? Oh, that's good. What? Could I use do what? To the opera? Of course I could. Righto, I'll pick them up at your office. Thank you, Templeton. Goodbye. Candy, dear, do you like the opera? I can take it or leave it. Why? It suddenly develops that I have two tickets tomorrow night for Tales of Hoffman. Oh, Rembrandt, I don't think I come, can Come, come, Candy. It'll do you good. You've been working too hard. You need a little relaxation. Tales of Hoffman, hmm? Okay. Who's the pal who gave them to you? An old friend of mine, Templeton Woodruff. He runs a steamship to Java and other places Ezio Pinza sings about. I finished the tea and left. Right then, the only opera I could think of was the one going on in an icebox at Martinello's. I've always tried to play straight with Ray Mallard, so I decided to tell Martinello my plan. Miss Mudson, I don't think it's such a good idea. Good evening, to... Carlo. I want to talk to you. That's what I mean. There's a gentleman here who... Oh, well, you've got a gentleman. That's fine. Three more and you've got a crowd. What I want to talk to you about is you this. You don't understand. The gentleman I'm talking about is from the police. The police? Yeah. Oh. Hello, Candy. Mallard. How about some scallopini? Well, up jumped the... Hello, Mallard, dear. I had an idea you'd like dinner here tonight. Uh, do you know my boy, Carl? Yes, yes, we've met. How do you do? How do you do? The signorina wish something to eat? No. No, thanks. I want to talk to you, though, Mallard. Sure. Come on into my booth. We'll share some salami. No, no, thanks. I want to see you downstairs. I don't think the food's as good down there. I agree, but it isn't the food. I'm talking about murder. Once again, I headed down into the catacombs of the Charlemagne. 
This time the act was a double. Mallard was right behind me. Then I looked around. We were a trio. Martinello was right behind Mallard. This is it. This is what? This is an icebox. Inside, you'll find a body dressed in a devil's costume. Okay, Carlo, let's humor the lady. Open the thing, will you? I... Yes. I'll open it. Lovely view of the beef. It's gone. The body's gone. Okay, Martinello, start talking and make some sense while you're doing it. Please, Miss Matson, I don't know anything. I haven't been down here all day. Get rid of those arched eyebrows, Martinello. You know something. What is it? Wait a minute, Candy. I'll do the questioning. In the first place, Carlo, was there or was there not a body in here? I... Well... Sure there was. He can't deny it. Here's a check for $2,000 signed by Martinello himself. Well, Carlo? Yes. There was a body, all right. Who was it? A friend of yours? No, Inspector. I never saw him before. Why did you call Miss Matson? Why didn't you come to see me about it? Well, you know, Inspector, the police... Uh, just because you were once arrested for bootlegging, Carlo, there's no reason to be afraid of the police. Uh, well, I'll put a couple of my men on the job and see what we can turn up. What? Is that all you're going to do, Mallard? No. Right now, I'm going back upstairs and have some of Carlo's scallopini. Mallard, are you out of your head? Look, Candy, in order to have a murder case, you've got to have a body. Obviously, we're fresh out. And until your pal with the devil's costume turns up, I intend to live my typical everyday life. Don't forget the mushrooms, Carlo. There are times when I get so mad at Mallard, I want to scream. I didn't, though. I only scrammed. I hung on to the 2000, however. I felt I deserved it just for getting my curiosity aroused, and it was aroused plenty. Corpses don't get up and walk out of ice boxes by themselves. But after all, Mallard had a point. There was nothing to be done without a body. So I went home and waded into a stack of dirty dishes that had been piling up. Then I fixed dinner and started a new stack of dirty dishes. Got a book and ducked into the bed. In the morning, I had an idea. After breakfast, I went down to the corner of Broadway and Columbus. That's where North Beach does a neat blend with Chinatown. On the corner was a Joe who sold newspapers. I'd known him for some time, and he seemed to like me. Hiya, Butch. Well, hello there, lady. How are you? Good. Can't complain. Who won the football game yesterday? Yeah, funny thing. I got all the news right inside here for seven cents. Mm, I get your point. Give me a chronicle, will you? Sure. Here. Thanks. Who do you like in the feature at Bay Meadows? A goat named Candy. What? What did you say? There's a pig named Candy running in the seventh. Take it or leave it. What a tip. I don't get it. Well, what's really on your mind, lady? Here. Here's a 20. You can play it on Candy all for yourself. Well. Do you know a gent named Martinello Butch? Mm. He owns the Charlemagne down the block. Sure. What about him? That's what I'm asking you. What about him? Oh, he's all right. A little screwy, but he keeps his nose clean. Is that all? Yeah. Should there be more? I don't know. Thanks, Butch. I hope Candy pays off. I was getting nowhere, that was for sure, and the rest of the day went the same way. Dead ends, blind alleys. I checked as many loose ends as I possibly could, but I was still stuck in a quandary. But the crusher claim late in the afternoon when I got a copy of the late paper and read where Candy came in at Bay Meadows and paid thirty-two twenty. And I hadn't had sense enough to get aboard. When I got home, the phone was ringing. Hello, Candy Matson. Oh, you're Candy Matson. I should play a fanfare. Oh, hello, Rembrandt, dear. How are you? Like an October morning. Every single one of me paws is breathing great, huge gulps of air. What? I just had a facial dove. Most invigorating. Uh what on earth for? I loved your old pores just the way they were. Candy, you've forgotten. I have? Forgotten what, Rembrandt? We're going to the opera tonight. Oh, Ducky, I'm sorry. I had forgotten. I'm afraid I'll have to renege. Now, Candy, you promised. And I don't care what you're involved in. It'll do you good. But, Rembrandt, I'm working on it. Perhaps you're right. Okay, I'll get ready. Wonderful, dear. Pick me up about a quarter of eight, will you? Pick you up a quarter of eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and another thing, Lamb. We may have to do some entertaining afterward. Uh, 
Do bring some cash, will you? Mm-hmm. That's the girl. That Rembrandt, always stony broke. I guess photography isn't what it's cracked up to be. I didn't mind, though. He's been a friend to me on more than one occasion. Well, if I was going to the opera, I had to start thinking in operatic terms. I fished around in the closet and came up with something that would have done any woman's heart good. One of those strapless affairs that you can't stop breathing in for one moment, otherwise the opera is no longer the main attraction. I powdered, perfumed, pouted, and rouged, and took off after Rembrandt. But just as I started to leave... Just a moment. Well, get a load of the Duchess. <laughs> it won't be Halloween for another couple of weeks yet. Oh, very funny. Come on in, Miller. What are you decked out for, Candy? Something you wouldn't understand. I'm going to the opera. Oh, I love the opera. Any horse opera with Tex Acuff in it. That's what I thought. What's on your mind, Mallard? I've got to pick up Rembrandt in ten minutes. Well, I was just driving by, so I thought I'd stop and tell you the news. News? About what? We found El Diablo. The guy in the icebox? Yeah. Martinello identified him. He was floating in the water off Aquatic Park. Any lead on him? The best. He was Salavini, the second baritone with the opera company. That's all, Candy. I hope you enjoy the performance tonight. A baritone with the opera company. Well, that explained the costume, but it didn't explain a lot of other things. I walked down the stairs with Mallard. He got in his squad car, flicked on the flashing red light, and with a burst of his siren, rolled down the street. I had to speak to Mallard about that. All the neighbors had their heads out of their windows as I climbed into my car and followed. What an exit. I picked up Rembrandt, and we drove up to the Civic Center. I found a place to park. A minor miracle. The last time I went to the opera, I had to drive almost to Palo Alto and come back by train. Rembrandt's friend must have been very influential. We had seats in the Diamond Horseshoe. They were presenting Tales of Hoffman, and a friend of mine, Dorothy Warrenchold, was singing the role of Antonia. It was a fine performance, and after the last curtain, I took Rembrandt, and we went backstage to see Dorothy. <laughs> This is her dressing room, Rembrandt. Yes? Hello, Dorothy. This is Candy Metz, and I have a friend with me. Oh, do come in, please, Candy. Candy, how are you? Couldn't be better. Dorothy, may I present Mr. Watson? Rembrandt, this is Miss Warrenchold. I'm delighted. You're in magnificent voice tonight, dear, dear. Thank you. Sit down, won't you? I've only a moment. We're rehearsing some of the scenes in Faust tonight. Rehearsing after a full evening's performance? It has to be done, Candy. Our baritone disappeared. We've had to replace him with a new man. Yes, yes, I know. By the way, Dorothy, I heard you on your Standard Hour broadcast a few weeks ago. It was a wonderful performance. I'm glad you liked it, Candy. I always look forward to those. What are your plans, Dorothy? Well, the season closes here, and then we open in Los Angeles. Oh, yes, of course. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Come in. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had guests. That's all right. Oh, Candy, I'd like to introduce Rolf Herbert. This is Miss Matson and Mr. Watson. Nice to meet you. Mr. Herbert is our new baritone. Oh, yes. That's why we're rehearsing tonight. I uh, won't take any more of your time, Dorothy. I just thought we'd save a few moments of rehearsal if I told you that I don't uh, move in that last scene. I sing upstage. That will leave you free to take as much stage as you like. Fine, Rolf. That will save time. Thanks. Oh, not at all. Glad to have met you, Miss Matson, Mr. Watson. Nice to have met you, sir. Yeah, see you on stage, Dorothy. Eh? Yes, Rolf. Rolf has a wonderful voice, and he's a good actor, too. You know, I think he'll be even better than Salavini. I've seen him before. Oh, yes, he's been in pictures and on the concert stage, and in opera, too. But he's, he's never really had a good break. This might be it. Uh-oh, that's it, Candy. I'm sorry, but I'll have to leave. Certainly, Dorothy. Say, why don't you stand in the wings? You can watch the rehearsal if you'd like. Oh, I'd love it. Come on, then. Follow me. All right. Your places, everyone. Places. This is all right, Candy. You can stay right here. Thanks, Dorothy. Glad to have met you, Mr. Watson. Also, as we used to say in the theater, go out there and kill him. <laughs> See you later. Where is Miss Warren Ah, there you are. Herbert, where's Herbert? I saw him just a moment ago in the dressing room. Well, it's late. We've got to keep moving. Please, somebody find Herbert. Ah! 
from way up in the heights of the stage, the opera house was pierced with a blood-curdling scream. That was no ordinary scream. It was the scream of death. You wait here, Rembrandt. Keep your eyes open. I'm going up to have a look. That scream wasn't in the score of Faust. I punched the button for the backstage elevator. It's a good thing they work fast and are speedy. Once inside, I pressed the button for the fourth gallery. I got out. This was the top of the opera house. The place was loaded with old sets, props, paper mache alligators, gold goblets. Then, over on the other side of the catwalk, I saw it. The body of a man all crumpled and distorted. I hit the catwalk and ran over. It was a hundred feet above the stage, and as I looked down, I could see a score of strained faces looking up through the darkness. I got on the other side and bent over the body. It was that of Rolf Herbert. Candy, down here. I think your man just stepped down underneath the stage. Again, I did a Mel Patton. The elevator shot me down to the stage level, and there was Rembrandt, wild-eyed. He came down the elevator on the other side, Candy. Then he cut across the stage and down those steps. Come on, Rembrandt, follow me. I may need help. We ran down the steps and into the bowels of the stage. It looked like a nightmare, a myriad of cross beams of steel for the rising stages. We cleared those and went around by the chorus dressing room. There was only one out. I remembered it. A door over in the corner, very seldom used, but it was open. It led into a long tunnel with giant steam pipes running overhead and to the right. This went underground over to the veterans' building. Down by your feet, there's a stream of water flowing in a trough. It's the old Hayes Valley Creek. Our killer decidedly knew his opera house. As we entered the tunnel, I could see him up ahead running like crazy, so we took off after him. We made the other side, and it breaks into a big engine room. As we came into the opening, I looked around. The engineer was lying on the floor out like a light blood spurting from his scalp. Then I glanced up. There was another door. This led into the veterans building itself and an avenue of escape onto Van Ness. I ran up. Then as we got into the long corridor, I saw Martinello breaking for the door. Stop! Stop, Martinello! Stop! You think I am a fool? I do if you don't stop! Try and get me! Okay, pal. You asked for it. <laughs> It was the first time I had ever shot a man. It didn't feel good. But he lived. And later, the doctors of law gave him a little pill. The cyanide kind they dropped inside the gas chamber at San Quentin. Martinello paid his debt. Details? Sure, I'll fill him in now. Martinello loved to sing. Ray Mallard had told me that. For years, Carlo had been hanging around the opera house, hoping to step into a role. This season, a director had jokingly told him that if he ran out of baritones, he'd let Carlo take over. Carlo took him seriously. He lured Salavini down to his restaurant on a fake emergency call, costume and all, and did him in. But then he became frightened. That's when he called me. It was worth $2,000 to have me hush things up. But I don't operate like that. He had a hunch I was going to tip off Mallard. That's when he removed the body from the icebox and dumped him into the bay. Carlo had also been at the performance of Tales of Hoffman. That's when he learned that they'd wrestled up Rolf Herbert to sing in place of Salovini. By this time, Martinello was obsessed with the idea of singing in the opera house and wouldn't stop at anything. Right after Herbert left Warren Schold's dressing room, he managed to get Herbert into the elevator and up to the fourth gallery behind the stage. That scream was produced by a six-inch stiletto through Herbert's heart. From the hands of Martinello. And that's when our chase began. I hope I never see that tunnel under the opera house again. That Mallard and his sentiment. It was he who gave me that gun just a week before, for my birthday. He said I needed protection. Well, darn it, I do. But I can't get Mallard to believe me. Instead, he just gives me guns. <laughs> Listen again at this same time next week. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 2A209. Heard
heard tonight were Harry Bechtel as Ralph Herbert, Jerry Walter as Carlo Martinello, Henry Leff plays the role of Inspector Mallard, and Jack Thomas is Rembrandt. Dorothy Warren Schold, star of the Standard Hour and the San Francisco Opera Company, was heard as herself. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. With the exception of Miss Warren Schold, any resemblance to actual people in tonight's play is purely coincidental. Candy Matson comes to you from San Francisco. This is Dudley Manlove speaking. You are tuned for the stars on NBC. Hello, Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Hello? Oh, girl, this is Rembrandt. I've been trying to get in touch with you for the last three days. I've been smog-bound. What? I've been visiting an aunt of mine in Los Angeles, Ducky. A fate worse than death. <laughs> However, I am glad to know you're back. How are you feeling for long hair music, Dove? Mm, I can take it or leave it. Why? In this case, I hope you can take it. Ever hear of a gentleman named Eric Spaulding? The noted English symphony conductor? Oh, of course. I used to know him in London. He's here to conduct a series of concerts. Bully for him. I know where I can get him a baton wholesale. He needs more than a baton, Candy, dear. He needs help. That's why I'm calling you. What's he want me to do, look for the lost chord? You don't know how close to being right you are, girl. Anyway, he's going to drop by me place this evening. I wonder if you could come over, too. Well, I was going to hit the prone position early tonight, but if you really want me to be there, I'll do it. Splendid, Candy. Come for dinner, won't you? I just bought a new chafing dish, and I'm whipping up a tasty scraping of pasta rasson. Well, how interesting. It is. It's spaghetti a la Watson. Candy Matson, the girl all San Francisco claims to know personally. That's because she hits the front pages of the newspapers more often than the three bridges. Gate, who came in late, Candy makes a tidy little living by minding her own business. The business being one of private investigation. Take this deal with Rembrandt Watson and Eric Spaulding. It sounded innocent enough to start with. The clue here, a corpse there can make a very interesting story. One that Candy Matson can tell you about herself right now. <laughs> What did the man say? A clue here, a corpse there? Well, he's almost right. The corpse came first, the clue later. I also ran across the most ingenious device ever dreamed up to cause a man to lose his job. And I managed to get a little culture on me, whether I wanted it or not. Because in the course of this little deal, I got better acquainted with Mozart, Brahms, Beethoven, even Cachaturian. Bless you. It all began by accepting Rembrandt's invitation that night for dinner and a meeting with Eric Spaulding. For the sake of the musician, I climbed into a gown that made music as I walked. It was cut trimly on the grace notes and called for a reprise every other bar. Then I put on my coda and went over to Rembrandt's place on California Street opposite old St. Mary's. Candy girl... Welcome to Menard Hill, La Miseri. Thank you, dear. Come in, come in. Breathtaking. Positively breathtaking. Thank you. You look gorgeous in that, uh, what is it, Candy? If you just stop and consider the thousands of man hours put in by little worms all over mulberry bushes, you wouldn't ask that question. Oh, silk. Mm-hmm. Where's the maestro? Oh, Eric hasn't arrived yet. He'll be here shortly. What's his problem, Ducky? I haven't the slightest idea, but he seems terribly upset. His worry seems to concern itself with his concert tomorrow night at the opera house. These boys with the long hair and coattails to match, they're always worrying. I don't know how most of them manage to live so long. Oh, help yourself to the port, dear. I had some hors d'oeuvre, but Henry and the great Dane beat us to them. Henry, heavens. I haven't seen him in ages. How is he, dear? Oh, I'm so glad you asked, Candy. He's missed you terribly. I'll let him in for just a moment. Oh, no, 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 Rembrandt, I, I didn't mean that. He's missed you so, dear. Oh, <laughs> Oh, Rembrandt, he's charging me. No, Henry, no. Oh. Oh. Rembrandt, help. 
He's got his paws all over my prow. Isn't that sweet? Such devotion. Candy adores you. Well, tell him to do his adulation from the floor with all four paws on it. Quick, Rembrandt, I'm becoming pigeon-chested. What a beautiful picture. Rembrandt. Mm. Oh, yes. Uh, Henry, down, sir. This instant. There we are. Now I know how that mud shoal in Chesapeake Bay felt when the big mole landed on it. Into the kitchen, Henry. Back to your side at beef. That's the lad. Oh, that must be Eric. Or another great Dane. Eric, dear boy, do come in. Thank you. Oh, what a charming place, Rembrandt. So bohemian. That's one word for it. Personally, I call it cluttered. Candy, dear, may I present Eric Spaulding? Eric, Candy Maxson. How, How do you do? do? Really quite an honor, Mr. Spaulding. I've heard many of your European recordings. Is that a fact? Yes, I had a very good orchestra in London. Nice chaps all. Played well together. I used to know the producer on the Standard Hour. That way I became quite familiar with the playing of the San Francisco Orchestra. How do the two compare, Mr. Spaulding? That's like trying to compare the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific. Both large bodies of water, but entirely different in characteristics. However, I feel the San Francisco organization would rate among the best in the world, with the proper conducting. And you feel you can give it the proper conducting? Most certainly. Mm, I see. Why don't you tell Candy about your innovation in music, Eric? I'm sure she'd be greatly interested. Oh, yes, I'm surely. It's nothing more nor less than applied showmanship, Miss Matson. I've always had the firm belief that music should paint a mental picture. I imagine the composers did, too. So I've made it a point to always include one number in my concerts where we play in fluorescent lighting. Oh, yes, I recall reading an article in Life about that. I've been severely criticized for it. I conduct with an illuminated baton. To me, the musical message is much better presented in that manner. The audience sits in the dark. It has a chance to interpret what the composer intended saying. Hmm, could be. I've been accused of everything from cheap theatricals to degrading the concert stage. But I'm sticking with it. I'm convinced the public appreciates what I'm trying to do. Uh, Rembrandt tells me you're bothered about something, Mr. Spaulding. Yes, I am. I'm an artiste, Miss Matson. I know only one thing, music. That's why I wish to speak to someone in uh, your line, investigating and that sort of thing. That sort of thing leads to money. I know. And I'll be very glad to retain you, if you can help me find out what I want to know. And that would be? Someone is trying to sabotage me, Miss Matson. The San Francisco concerts are critical stepping stones in my career. I've given two concerts. Each time during the selection where we black out the lights, the orchestra, en masse has hit one foul, rotten chord. Well, didn't you get it straightened out in rehearsal? That's just it. It never happened in rehearsal. I've checked the score afterward. Perfect. I've talked to the orchestra personnel. They're more amazed than I. To say the least, it must be extremely embarrassing at a moment like that. Believe me, words haven't been invented to describe such a feeling of mortification. The audience starts to titter, then laughs. By then, the whole thing has been shot to blazes. My reputation is at stake, Miss Matson. I see what you mean. I thought perhaps with your trained sleuthing instincts, you might be able to help me. My old friend Rembrandt here recommends you highly. Thanks, old friend here. You've got me interested, Mr. Spaulding. When did you say your next performance is? Tomorrow night at the Opera House. Tell you what. I don't know what your contract calls for, but whatever it is, we'll split the fee and I'll go to work for you. What? Why, that's preposterous. Isn't the future of your career worth it, Mr. Spaulding? Why, I... Very well. I think it's outrageous, but what can one do? Okay. Now, when do you rehearse for tomorrow night's concert? Tomorrow morning, at 10 o'clock. Very well, I'll be there. Just one word of caution. Pay no attention to me whatsoever. Make like as if I don't even exist. Agreed. Oh, I'm so glad everything's settled. Now we can get to the spaghetti vaso. Me food is practically chafing at the dish. Let's have at the regular stuff, shall we? The spaghetti boisson was magnificent. Rembrandt has the green thumb for taking the most ordinary food, adding a bird's nest or two and a dash of some witch's potion and making it taste like ambrosia. Uh, there was only one drawback. For days after, you walked around like you had a red-hot barbecue pit in your stomach. 
I stopped off on my way home, bought a chronicle, completed the journey, and piled into bed. Then I read the paper, missed Kane, caught DeRoos, glanced at the radio column, and then concentrated on the musical section. There it was, Spalding's concert for the following evening. The first movement from Brahms first, the Fountains of Rome, the Rienzi, so on and so forth, and, and for his blackout selection, Swan Lake. With that, I dozed off. And before I could pick up the remnants of a dream I'd had the night before, it was morning and I was dressing in on my way to the opera house. Just a moment, young lady. You're not with the orchestra. No, no, I'm here on official business for Mr. Spaulding. Oh, sure. Go right on in. I passed through the stage door and onto the stage itself. Just as I did, a little faraway thought started tickling the back regions of my brain. Spaulding, Spaulding. By a strange quirk, there was a gal who plays first flute in the orchestra named Spaulding... I worked my way around to where the musicians were unpacking their instruments. There she was, the gal herself. Hello there. Oh, hello. How are you? Fine, thanks. You don't remember me, do you? I'm Candy Matson. Oh, yes, the young lady detective. You used to drop backstage now and then to the standard broadcast. That's right. Nice to see you again. Thank you. What's this I hear about the orchestra falling on its face the last two concerts? It's an amazing thing, Miss Matson. We're at a complete loss of words for an explanation. I understand it's front-page news all over the country. And why not? A well, thing of this sort is news. Eric's fit to be tied, of course. I can't blame him. Incidentally, I just happen to think, isn't your name Spaulding, too? I beg your pardon? I said, isn't your name Spaulding, too? Why, yes, it is. We spell it differently, however. Oh, so? Yes. Eric spells his name S-P-A-U-L-D-I-N-G. I have no you in my name. Mm-hmm. You both have a decided British accent. Oh, you think so? I rather thought I'd lost mine. No, hardly. Uh, tell me, do how do the members of the orchestra feel about these numbers played under fluorescent light? Well, it doesn't bother them. They think it's slightly silly, but they don't pay any attention to it. Each conductor has his own little idiosyncrasies. I see. Well, I hope you have a fine rehearsal, Mrs. Spaulding. Miss. Miss Spaulding. Oh, yes. Miss. You, um, you're going to be around for the concert this evening? I believe so. I find it becomes more interesting all the time. Something was phony with a gal, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I tossed it off and decided to think about that angle later. In the meantime, I ducked into a quiet corner of the wings and listened carefully to the whole rehearsal. Then it came time for the blackout number, Swan Lake. It went beautifully, without a hitch. At the finish, Eric mopped his moist brow and spoke to the orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. You all know what has happened to these particular spots. The rehearsal this morning has gone beautifully. I thank you. I hardly think I need to remind you that tonight's concert will be critical, to say the least. If we repeat what has happened in the past two performances, I shudder to think what will be said of me. And you, as an organization, will you all please pay a special attention to the score this evening for my sake, as well as yours? That is all, and again, I thank you. With that, Spaulding dismissed the orchestra. I waited a reasonable length of time, then dropped around to his dressing room. The concertmeister was in with Eric, so I waited. And waited. Finally, he was alone. Or so I thought. Oh, Miss Matson, uh, come in, come in. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Spaulding. I thought you were by yourself. Oh, a thousand pardons. Uh, Miss Matson, may I present Baldo Raimondi, my arranger? Mr. Raimondi. A yeah, pleasure indeed. Well, there was something you wanted to talk about, Miss Matson? No, no. Oh, that's all right. I, I'm just pushing off. <laughs> Do that, will you, Baldo? And uh, take care of that second bar after letter K. It should be an A natural. Uh, no, Eric, not an A natural. It should be A flat. Ah, yes, yes, that's right. A flat. Yes. I'm so upset. I well, Take care of it, will you, Waldo? Uh, right -o. I'll see you back at the hotel. Uh, very happy to have met you, Miss Matson. Also, Mr. Romani. Well? Well, yourself. I don't understand. Neither do I. Let's both get with it. Are you acquainted personally with any members of the orchestra here? Oh, in a vague sort of way. How vague would your friendship with the first Plutus be? How did you know about her? 
I didn't, but now you've told me. Almost. What about her? I was hoping this would be kept quiet. She was my wife. I had a hunch it was something like that. Could she have anything to do with your lack of grace notes? No, not Nona. Nona? The former Mrs. Spalding. Well, we've got to start somewhere. She's as good a target as any. I'm afraid you're on the wrong scent, Miss Maxim. Nona and I had our differences. We split up. She came to America and joined the orchestra here in San Francisco. She's respected and admired. She wouldn't do anything to jeopardize her musical career, I'm sure. But she might yours. Have you cut up any old capers since you've been here, Mr. Spaulding? No, we haven't spoken. It's an unwritten rule we've both observed. Hmm. This has the same aroma Monterey has during the sardine season. Well, I'll keep plugging away. Good luck on the concert tonight. You need it. The hotel where Spaulding and Company made its headquarters was just a hop, skip, and a jump from the opera house. But I would have looked silly getting there that way, so I drove. A simple question produced results. Waldo Raimondi was in room 1812. And before I could ponder whether that was from the overture of the same number, I was there. Come in, please. Oh, hello. Uh, come in, won't you? Thank you. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Oh, no, no, not at all. Seems we have a music lover in our midst. However, don't you think Eric might resent this little visit? Why, you little... Cut it, Ramondi. You're lucky I only slapped your face. I'm here on business only. Get out of here. Not yet, small time. I want to have a little talk with you. Who do you think you are, walking in here and making demands of me? The name is Miss Matson. That doesn't mean anything to you, I'm sure, but I happen to be a private investigator. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't think that... You will forgive me, won't you? I'll call a meeting of the board and let you know. I've got a couple of questions to ask. Give me the right answers and we'll both save time. Gladly, if I can. How long have you been with Spaulding? Almost uh, 17 years. Did you know that the first flutist here was once his wife? Yes. We don't talk about it. Neither do we talk to her. What about this studied confusion that's occurred during the last two concerts? It's most incredible. None of us can understand it. No, none of us. Doesn't it strike you that a whole symphony orchestra just couldn't possibly go sour unless the whole symphony orchestra had agreed? Or unless the score was wrong. Oh, but that couldn't be it either. Both Eric and I have checked immediately afterward, and that leaves us... Nowhere. Exactly. I have only one further suggestion. And that would be... Get better acquainted with Nona Spaulding. What do you mean by that? You are a private investigator, Miss Madsen. Why not apply the tools of your trade? The whole thing was becoming as simple as hydrogen. Using my cool Sam Spade logic, I decided to do nothing until after the concert that evening. So I went home to my penthouse on Telegraph Hill, showered and slipped into something movie writers would have described as... comfortable? Then I called Rembrandt on the phone. Watson Studios. This is Candy Matson, Private Eyeball. How delightful. We both got to plug in. Yes. What's on your mind now? You, dear. How would you like to attend the Spalding concert tonight? Oh, Candy, I've heard music before. So have I. But this is more or less a command performance. I recognize the command in your voice. Very well. Shall I dress? It's customary, isn't it? I mean, how would you like me? In soup and fish? No, Ducky, I've seen your soup and fish. It's covered with soup and fish. No, just come as you are. Oh, candy. Very well. As you say, dress. I'll pick you up about 7.30. Splendid. Uh, where are we sitting? The diamond horseshoe? That's right. Backstage in the wings. I bustled about getting ready. As long as I was going to be backstage, I didn't have to get too fancy. So in practically nothing flat, I was out in the car and once again driving over to Rembrandt's place. He was ready, he jumped in, and we took off for the opera house. The carriage trade was arriving at the carriage trade entrance, so I found a place to park out in back, and then we went in, talked to Wally, one of the stagehands, and got two chairs on the left. Just at that moment, the concertmeister gave the cue for the orchestra to tune up. That was Spaulding's cue to float out from stage right and make his entrance. He carried more ham per pound than you'd find in a Chicago stockyard. 
He minced to the podium, bowed, scraped, then faced the orchestra. It all started nicely enough, even though the orchestra was playing as if it were sitting on eggs. First the Brahms, then fountains of Rome. They took a bath in the first fountain. It felt so good they went on to another. Then another, and they were through, through all the fountains. Now it was time for the production number. The lights dimmed. The fluorescent lights on the music stands came on. Spalding flipped a switch and his baton lit up. You could feel a tenseness come over the audience. And the orchestra started hatching its eggs. Eric gave the downbeat and Swan Lake was underway. seemed to feel that the worst was over. You could almost hear the snapping of spines as the audience relaxed and settled back in their seats. And that's when it happened. <laughs> it had happened again. The most horrible sounding chord I'd ever heard. The audience stood up. This time there were no laughs, just a stunned amazement. The orchestra stopped playing and Spalding threw his baton on the stage and walked off into the wings. Slowly, the orchestra followed. I was just as dumbstruck as the rest. Then I got my wits about me and ducked around to the rear. Come on, Rembrandt. To where, girl? Anywhere. I want to talk to people, find out what happened. Don't you know? They blew a king-size clinker. Oh, that was well established. It'll be heard around the world. But I want to find out how it happened. Uh-oh. There's Spalding talking to Raimondi. I'm ruined, Waldo, through. Washed up. How can this sort of thing happen? How can it possibly happen? Oh, look, Eric, calm down. It's not as bad as you're making it out. I'm not making anything out. I'm facing the facts. I'm through. Do you suppose I can face the critics, the public, after three successive performances like this? Oh, there you are, Miss Matson. A lot of help you've been. You let it happen again. Cool off, Buster. Uh, you can't avoid something uh, happening when you don't know what that something is. This is a something that's never been written into the books. Or, wait a minute. Hasn't it? All of a sudden, I've got me an idea. Great heavens! Are you all the prophets? What's going on here tonight? If you'll forgive my sudden departure, I intend finding out. <laughs> We made like the cavalry going up San Juan. The scream had come from off stage over in the dressing rooms. That's where we headed. By the time we got there, a crowd had gathered. And there, in room 14, with her flute clutched firmly in her hands, lay Nona Spaulding. <laughs> Excuse me. Pardon me. How is she, Candy? She's not feeling well, Rembrandt. As a matter of fact, she isn't feeling at all. She's dead. <laughs> this was the kind of development I hadn't counted on at all. An orchestra coming apart like wet tissue paper is one thing, but murder is another. That's where my friend Inspector Mallard comes into the picture. I made a call to headquarters, but he was out. So instead, a couple of his boys came over. I left the entire thing in their capable hands and tried to clear up a little unfinished business of my own. You still play the cello, Rembrandt. Strictly for me on amusement, Dove. Why? Well, you know music. Take a look at the score. Right about... about here. Oh, yes. This is just about where they hit that foul chord. That's right. Notice anything wrong? Let me see. This bar looks all right. Hmm, and so does this one... They didn't get past this point. Look carefully. Why, yes. Little indentations alongside the notes. Ever so slight, but there, nevertheless. The pattern is beginning to take shape, Rembrandt. And if you'll look again, you'll find these little irregularities throughout the whole score. Candy, you're right. Now's as good a time as any to find out if I'm right or not. Wally! Wally! Is that you, Candy? That's right. Do me a favor, Wally. When I shout, now... Switch on the fluorescent lights, will you? Okay. Now hand me that score, Rembrandt. We'll place it on the music stand like this. Good. Keep your eyes on this bar right here. Don't look away for one instant. Now, Wally. Okay. 
Watch now. There are the lights. What do you see? Candy. Incredible. That chord changed right before me very eyes. Why, nobody could play that. It has dissonance over dissonance. That's what you heard tonight. Keep watching. The regular lights again, Wally. Right, Candy. There. You see? Back to normal again. But you don't see the bad chord, do you? No. This is amazing. Most amazing. The copyist used a certain kind of ink that vanished under the fluorescent lights. And at that time, a whole new score appeared with that awful chord buried in it. Diabolical, isn't it? Yes, isn't it? Too bad you're so clever, Miss Matson. Hi, Raimondi. I wasn't sure for a while, but when Mrs. Spaulding got it in the dressing room, I had my money on you. It's a shame your knowledge won't do you any good. You're not going to be able to use it. You see, here in my pocket, a very competent thirty-eight. Now move, both of you, quietly... Over to Eric's dressing room. You better do as the man says, Rembrandt. Oh, there you are, Miss Matson. I want to... Oh, no, you don't, Eric. Spalding, you all right? Yes. Yes, I'm all right. Just nick me. Come on, Rembrandt. He's ducking around backstage. There he goes. He's trapped and he knows it. The cops are over on the other side of the stage. He's coming back this way. Rembrandt, the stage has been raised on the elevators. He's going to run right into that opening. Raimondi! Look out! Raimondi! How do you feel, Spaulding? A little weak. Just hand me a spot of that brandy, will you? I shall be all right. Sure. Tell me, why was Raimondi gunning for you? Until tonight, I didn't know he was. All of a sudden, that name Ramondi means something to me. Here's your brandy. Thank you. Yes, Balto was a very promising violinist. Great things had been predicted for him until the summer of 1933. What happened? We were driving through Sussex when my car overturned. His left hand was badly smashed. Had to have the last three fingers amputated. That was the end of his career. First, he was bitter, wouldn't speak to me. Said it was all my fault. Little by little, I won him over. Then, because music was his world, I gave him a position of companion and librarian. He's been with me ever since. Yes, plotting your downfall. And very cunning, too. He waited all these years to pull the switch on his clever device. Why is that, Miss Matson? Your wife's bowling. Raimondi had it figured out that you'd attach all the blame to your ex-wife. Poor Nona. Gone. And Waldo, too. Yes. And all because that accident left a bigger scar on his mind than it did on his hand. Well, I'll see you, Spaulding. That was some concert tonight. It seemed to have just about everything. It was too bad about the ex, Mrs. Spaulding. She let her heart rule her head. She went to Raimondi's dressing room to make an overture to perhaps make an effort to patch up her lost romance with Eric. She walked in at a bad time. Raimondi was applying the finishing touches to his phony score. There was an assortment of ink all over the table. At the time, it didn't mean anything to Nona, but during the performance, she discovered the same thing I did. After that bad chord, she rushed off stage, ready to apply the crusher to Waldo. He saw what she was up to and beat her to it the window weight over the head. Well, like I've said many times, some of that music gets too deep for me. I think I'll just stick to something not quite so complicated. Something simple, enjoyable. Something you can understand. Like bop, perhaps? Listen again next week at the same time. For excitement and adventure, just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Heard tonight were Hal Burdick as Eric Spaulding, Harry Bechtel as Waldo Raimondi, and Norma Tuart as Mrs. Spaulding. Jack Thomas plays the part of Rembrandt Watson. 
The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Sound effects are created by Bill Brownell and Jay Rendon. Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's story are entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. Bill Walker speaking. The program came to you from San Francisco. You are tuned for the stars on NBC.